director in Angola for the Central Intelligence Agency, the forum was held in Washington in November. American University, I welcome you on the behalf of AUPs, the graduate students of the School of International Studies and the Economic Graduate Student Union. John Stockwell is the highest ranking CIA agent to go public. He is an ex-Marine and winner of CIA's Medal of Merit. He served as an officer in charge in Vietnam and as director of covert war in Angola. He served with the CIA for 12 years. John Stockwell is the author of eight books, the most well-known being In Search of Enemies, which he wrote about the CIA and over which the CIA sued him. As a result, he received a court order ordering him to submit everything that he writes to the CIA for censorship and which awarded all the royalties of the book to the CIA. This makes uh, John the only author I know who regularly asks people not to buy his book. John has also written fiction, including a novel entitled uh, Red Sunset, um, unique for its uh, premonitions of glasnost in, the, glasnost in the Soviet Union. Last September, I spoke to John, and I asked him if he could focus his talk on Central America and Nicaragua. At the time, the five Central American presidents had just agreed to the demobilization of the Contra, and the Nicaraguan elections were underway. Our main concern was to keep Central America and especially Nicaragua's upcoming elections in the arena of rational discussion and to counteract the Bush administration's destabilization and misinformation policies. The topic has become, a time, has become timely in a way that couldn't have been foreseen since Ortega uh, was forced to declare an end to the, his unilateral ceasefire uh, last week. We are fortunate to have John Stockwell with us tonight to help shed light on the events in this region. Please join me in welcoming John Stockwell. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and for the welcome and for the good turnout. Uh, let me begin by correcting a minor detail, and this is not the fault of my host. Uh, I'm not the highest ranking CIA officer to go public. There have been CIA directors going public all the time. I think I have the distinction of being one of the highest case officers to go public and endeavor to tell the truth about what the CIA has been up to. We're going to talk about that tonight, the CIA secret wars, but what I've done over the years since I left the agency is to pursue in my readings the broader subjects of how the CIA secret wars, to understand them for sure, and show how they interrelate to the broader problems that also affect, or perhaps really affect, our national security interests. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about the secret wars of the CIA and the nuclear arms race uh, in the age of glasnost with an ex-CI director for president. We've got Mikhail Gorbachev's policies of openness on the one hand and George Bush on the other side saying we're a kinder and more humane nation. They're telling us that the communist bloc is breaking apart, the Cold War is over, the arms race is over, and if this were altogether true, it would be absolutely wonderful. Unfortunately, our, pro our world is still fraught with some grievous problems. Our planet is still booby-trapped with 60,000 thermonuclear weapons, and our factories are still producing them as fast as ever and testing and developing them as vigorously as ever. We've just uh, gotten through spending $2.2 trillion, and that's a conservative figure that's been published, on the largest arms buildup uh, in the history of the world, at least at peace and coincidentally increased our national debt, we were not a better nation before, by about the same amount of $2 trillion. The United States still has an open policy of supporting coups and destabilizations and low-intensity conflicts in every corner of the, the globe, the U.S. doing this through the CIA 
uh, my old organization. And as you all well know, our society is said to be drowning in a sea of drugs. And integral to all of this is the systematic destruction of our environment. And it's my thesis that these subjects interrelate. Drug trafficking, the arms race, conventional wars, the destruction of the environment, and the killing of the United States president in 1963, and the CIA's secret wars, all of these things are interwoven together. And it's my purpose tonight to try to give you, in one hour, a sense of how these things interrelate. It's a vast subject, a dense subject. I can't possibly do justice to it in the time allowed this means I'm going to have to insult your intelligence by skimming across the top of subjects that you could get a PhD dissertation written in and still not cover thoroughly. So all I can do is just try my best. And in the question and answer, I'll stay with you a goodly time taking questions in detail on the areas that you want to pursue in greater detail. I also publish a bibliography, and we'll put the the address up here where you can order copies of it of the best 120 books that I've found on the subject and I have a brief review of each of the books in it and some introductory remarks that may help you uh, to pursue this subject. Mind you, we have thousands of books have been written about national security and world security and U.S. security and these are merely the best 120 books that I've found on the subject. This massive documentation, of course, is, is the salvation of the intellectually uh, tuned, I urge you to read for yourselves. Do not take anything I'm saying tonight as the gospel. I'm telling you that our leaders lie to us. They lie to us systematically. They lie to us with a purpose that may not be your purpose. Uh, some of their lies, if you're a young man, may motivate you uh, to go off someday and die, be killed, or to kill people. And the only way you can defend yourself uh, against other people programming you because we are programmable. Marine Corps boot camp taught me that. They can teach you and get you fired up, rah, 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 and then say charge, and you'll charge up the hill without asking why, and perhaps not come, you know, come down the hill uh, feet first. The French have a saying that I mangle in translation, them that don't do politics will be done. If you don't defend yourself by filling your mind with a true understanding of what's happening in the world, then others will fill it up for you and then at some point in time use the information and the conditioning that they've planted in your mind and breast uh, to use you, if you will. Once again, I have a bibliography. I urge you to read for yourself. I urge you to reach inside the, the, the books and go to their bibliographies and pursue the subject on beyond and travel and inform yourselves. We're going to take Nicaragua tonight. We're going to get into these awesome subjects of the arms race and whatnot from my specialty, which was CIA's activities. I was a manager in three of the CIA's so-called secret wars or low-intensity conflicts or whatever you would call them. Uh, we're going to start with them, of course, and we're going to start with Nicaragua as a case study because it's particularly timely, because the elections are coming up, because we've been beating up on Nicaragua for the last 10 years, and coincidentally, uh, because it's very much in the news right now, today, tonight, during this last week. Uh, in fact, the Washington Post has special op-eds on it and editorial pieces on it today. I was just reading them in my hotel room. The Contras have moved several thousand armed fighters down into the country, but the State Department says they're not there to fight, they're just down there to encourage people to vote. But they're killing, but they're killing people, and Ortega sees his responsibility as trying to stop people from killing people in his country. He's doing exactly what President George Bush would do if there were a force in this country gunning people down. And so he has said that this ceasefire is no longer a ceasefire, and our media the State Department Post and the other newspapers that are published in this city and elsewhere are all falling right into line with the propaganda lines of attacking Ortega and trying to use his actions uh, to, to put him on, on, under, under political pressure to discredit him uh, if they can, to the degree they can. Now, another reason we're picking Nicaragua for a case study is because it's just particularly useful of all the hundreds of CIA operations that we could dissect and mind you Angola is in the news and I was once chief of the Angola task force on a subcommittee of the National Security Council called the Interagency Working Group uh, commanding 
although I was working closely under the supervision of Jim Potts of the Africa Division and Henry Kissinger and the CIA Director Bill Colby. And Angola is very much in the news and Savimbi was just in town and I'm also clearly tempted to talk about Angola. But Nicaragua is a better example because it's closer to the United States culturally and physically and because this covert action destabilization that we've run against Nicaragua has been open on both ends. Usually these things are closed. Usually our government is covering them and hiding them uh, to the greatest deg degree it can and the country we're attacking becomes hostile and paranoid and seals its borders. In the case of Nicaragua until last year, until quite recently, it had a policy of remaining open. Anyone from the states who wanted to go down and have a look could do so without getting a visa. Meanwhile, in Washington, the thing was debated quite openly for more aid and details of the aid and abuse of the aid and the little gradations of rules we put on how the aid could be spent. So we knew it from both ends. And during the entire period of the 80s, I was traveling back and forth from Washington to Nicaragua to elsewhere, informing myself to assess this thing uh, and also using the material in my in my lectures. Also, unlike Angola, there was never a chance in Angola that we would make it into another Vietnam, putting in U.S. troops seriously. And this was a very real possibility in Nicaragua during the mid-80s. It's a remote possibility today. The U.S., of course, as you know, has had a fixation on Nicaragua uh, since the mid-1800s. It's been the issue of a second canal or a better canal, of different interests trying to develop it, of military interventions, of putting the Marines in there, a half a dozen times to occupy it, to dominate it, to force elections, to control events in that country. The Marines were eventually withdrawn in 1933 as a result of the international pressure of the international peace movement, and at that time we switched into a more subtle uh, phase of the ancient Monroe Doctrine, where instead of using Marines so much with gunboat diplomacy, we created a National Guard with officers trained at our academies here in the States and then maintained control of the country by proxy without taking the heat for having our troops inside the country itself. It's been said that this event uh, was the birth of neocolonialism. This also was the kickoff of the U.S. policy of establishing a military oligarchy. We set up schools and trained tens of thousands of military and police officers in countries all over Latin America and Africa in some cases and Asia, putting them through our academies, arming them, paying their salaries afterwards, trying to create and successfully creating a situation where we, we would have a fraternity of people in these countries in power who were more loyal to the fraternity of our own military than they were to the peasants and people of their own countries. Meanwhile, this cat and mouse game that we've played with Nicaragua since 1981 is a classic case of what CI directors uh, more recently themselves call destabilization. The point is to put pressure on the targeted government by ripping apart the social and economic fabric of the country. Now that's words, you know, social and economic fabric. That means making the people suffer as much as you can until the country plunges into chaos, until at some point you can step in and impose your choice of governments on that country. The rationales we've used in Nicaragua are classic. We've been fighting communism. It's been national security. They're a, a Marxist bastion in our own backyard and all of that. More specifically, our leaders have said at first that the purpose of this program was to interdict the flow of arms from Nicaragua to the rebels in El Salvador. Unable to prove any flow of arms whatsoever from Nicaragua into El Salvador, they eventually got into the line which they use in the last few years of returning Nicaragua to democracy. And then we pointed out to them that Nicaragua never had a democracy, certainly not under the Somoza dictatorships. So they call it the democratization of Nicaragua, ignoring the fact that, that Nicaragua, by the way, had elections in 1984 that were much more democratic than the elections that we had in this republic. We don't live in a democracy in the United States uh, itself. Now, we, I submit, will never know exactly what the Sandinistas would have done with this country of Nicaragua if we had left them alone to react to the country's problems according to their own uh, interests and ideology and compulsions. We do know, however, 
that they abolished the death sentence at exactly the same time the United States was reinstituting the death sentence in this country. Maximum penalty in their courts is 30 years in jail. They released thousands of the hated National Guard that they had in their custody, saying that they would not jail anyone for having belonged to an organization. They would have to be convicted of individual crimes. They launched a literacy campaign to teach each Nicaraguan to read and write. They set out to build 2,500 clinics so each Nicaraguan would have access to some kind of medical treatment. These are all things that Somoza, the, the dictator, backed up by the United States, had not gotten around to doing. And they launched the most ambitious land reform campaign in the history of Central America. And they did this by maintaining a free enterprise economy. If you owned land and you were working it, you kept it. Uh, they were taking the lands that Somoza and his family uh, and the people who had fled had stolen or taken or gotten and they were turning those lands back to the people in different forms and cooperatives, feeling their way as they went, making mistakes as they went, trying this solution and that one, but with the purpose of getting the land back to the people so people would work land, or own land, relate to land, and profit from the land that they worked on in their own country. And they brought something totally new, I believe, uh, to the modern world, which is a, 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 a unity between Christianity and Marxism, of asserting that the church should have, if it has any purpose and justification at all, it's that it should be the church of the people, the church of the poor, not the church of the oligarchy and the rich and the wealthy. I've been in, in Borge, Thomas Borges' office, the Minister of Interior, and counted on the wall the 25 Catholic icon collector items that he's put on the wall there. If he had I counted them twice. There were exactly 25. That infers that he must have others at home, and these were the selected ones that he put on, that he, he chose to display uh, on his wall. And until today, despite this continued attack, war is what the World Court called it, that we've waged on Nicaragua, Nicaragua has yet to commit one act of war against the United States. But instead of joining them, and building the healthiest, most dynamic, most enthusiastic country in Central America, we spent over a billion dollars during the 80s to destabilize the country. We set out systematically to create conditions where the farmer could not get his produce to market, where children couldn't go to school, where women were terrified inside their homes as well as outside their homes of being attacked, where the hospitals were treating wounded people instead of sick people where government administration grinds to a halt, where the trucks don't run, the bridges are blown, the salaries aren't paid, you can't get a driver's license, all the infrastructure breaks down, and of course eventually international capital is scared away and the country plunges into chaos and bankruptcy. We created the Contra program beginning in about 1981. There was a Newsweek article following up if there was plenty of documentation on this, on November 7 and 8, 1982, that said, here we go again. We've done this before. It's been a mistake before. We're going into Nicaragua. Once again, we're, we're supporting the wrong side, Newsweek noted. It said that we had elected to support the only truly evil, totally unacceptable faction in the Nicaraguan equation, that being the remnants of Somoza's hated National Guard. But using Argentine trainers at first and then eventually CI mercenaries, we armed and directed this small army from bases mostly in Honduras to attack in Nicaragua and destabilize. Systematically, they were blowing up granaries, sawmills, bridges, government offices, schools, health centers, mines, mining roads, ambushing trucks, raiding farms and villages. We have massive documentation of all this because the country, as I said, was kept open. For the first few years, CBS, NBC, ABC, BBC, CBC all had crews down there in residence, and when there would be atrocities, they would rush up and film them. We also had what totaled eventually dozens of thousands of witnesses from this country and Canada and Europe and Australia going down and living right in the towns and villages with the people, and when there were atrocities, rushing out to film and photograph and document them. Like I say, massive documentation. There's also been direct U.S. military involvement in all of this. U.S. military mining harbors, overflights, underwater demolitions teams going in to blow up things in the ports. 
There's been assassination of, of religious leaders, teachers, health workers, elected officials, government administrators, CBS, NBC, others have footage of this. Uh, the Americas Watch, the Witness for Peace, we've managed to come up with lists of the names of hundreds and hundreds of leaders who've been assassinated down there. We also have admission of this program by President Ronald Reagan on national television in the debates with Walter Mondale because an assassination manual that we were using to train these people, uh, the Contras with, was brought to the attention of the press and it became a big issue and led to a change, a slight change, in the politics in Congress towards the Contra program. And President Reagan said this was the work of the CIA station chief in Tegucigalpa. And I can assure you the CIA was not appreciative of him, you know, with that particular slip up. Because one, it attributed, you know, assassinations, a policy. Of, so the media went to the White House the next, uh, the following Monday and said, did that mean that there had been a change in U.S. policy against assassinations? And the White House playing, you know, double speak said, well, no, not really, because in our opinion, assassination applies to world leaders only when you're killing re religious leaders or regional leaders. Uh, it's not assassination, it's just uh, killing. <laughs> terror has been a part of this program. Raw terror, as raw as anything that happens in the Middle East or elsewhere. These Quantras have been going into villages, they've been hauling families out with other mem members of the family forced to watch they've been castrating fathers gang raping mothers slashing off their breasts again while the children are forced to watch Two hundred, uh, 22,000 is the figure the New York Times gave the last time I counted as the number of people killed in this thing and again this is nobody's propaganda this is documented and condemned by the world court by the Presbyterian Church by the Methodist Church by broad segments of the Catholic Church and, and again by these dozens of thousands of witnesses who've gone down from other countries to see for themselves. As you recall, President Reagan remained throughout unapologetic for this activity. He took pride in saying, quote, I'm a Contra. He took pride in saying that these people were the moral equivalent of his founding fathers. And of course, George Bush has never missed a chance to identify himself with these Contras. Again, read for yourself. Read Contra Terror by Reed Brody, former Assistant Attorney General of New York State. Read The Contras by Dieter Eich. Read With the Contras by Christopher Dickey, a so-called moderate journalist representing the Washington Post in Central America. Read Witness for Peace, what we have seen and heard. Read The Lawyers Commission on Human Rights. Read The Violations of War on Both Sides by the America's Watch. Read The Mosquito Indians in Nicaragua. Read Washington's War on Nicaragua by Holly Sklar. Or go to Nicaragua and see for yourself. You have to get a visa now, but there's not one person in this room who cannot find a way in the coming summer, for example, or during the winter even, to raise enough money to go to Nicaragua and see for yourself. And I urge you to do so because we have a unique situation. It may be 10 or 20 years before there'll be another covert action which is so open that you can be sure of the facts, you can have absolute knowledge of what your government is doing there, and you can go inside the country and circulate and see the effects of our destabilization policy on the targeted country. Of course, throughout these years, there's been a relentless pro propaganda program to discredit the Sandinistas. We've labeled the Sandinistas as totalitarian dictators. We said at first that they were flowing arms into El Salvador. We claimed when they put together a military machine to defend their country from this attack, we claimed they were building a war machine that, quote, threatened the stability of all of Central America, without noting that they did not have strategic weapons. They did not have tanks and bombers that could, in fact, attack other countries. We charged them with censorship, specifically closing down La Prensa newspaper, and it was several years after we were crowing about this censorship by the government before it came out that La Prensa was on the United States government payroll. The National Endowment for Democracy using U.S. government funds was subsidizing La Prensa as our propaganda arm right in the capital of that country while we brutally destabilized that country. And of course, in 1984, we launched a vigorous campaign to discredit their elections. Now, they had elections that were supervised and witnessed by United Nations groups and other groups who, who, who said that they were as fair as any elections they had seen in Central America 
in many, many years. And these elections were quite an embarrassment uh, to Ronald Reagan, who was then the champion of the Contra program in this country, and I'm sure to George Bush today, because they were quite a bit more democratic than the elections that we held in this country during the same year. I suggest you go to the Covert Action Information Bulletin Number 25 from the summer of 1986. There are later versions of the bulletin being sold outside tonight for an article by Mr. Michael Parenti discussing the democracy uh, in Nicaragua. They had seven parties with candidates running for election. We had two. They turned out 75.4% of the vote. We turned out 53% of the vote in this country. They voted directly. We voted for electors who selected our leaders. They passed a law that every legitimate party would have an equal amount of money to spend for campaign purposes. In this country, if you can raise more money, you can buy more television time, you have a much better chance of winning the election. In fact, the, in terms of direct voter participation in this republic, we are not a democracy, we're a republic. In terms of voter representation, we're rated 75th in the world, just before South Africa, which is 76th. Another element of propaganda that we were slamming them with was claiming that the Sandinistas were smuggling drugs to finance their revolution. We staged scenes paying the pilot Barry Seals, uh, plea bargaining a deal with him to land a plane in Nicaragua to kick some bales of marijuana out on the runway to photograph by satellite so President Reagan could, could put them on television saying this proves they're smuggling drugs. In fact, the record is out massively clear. The Contra program was smuggling drugs. I won't go into the details right here now in the question and answer we will. I'll mention them later, but we had the Senator Kerry investigation. We had also intensive investigation by our media. We have dozens of cases where people in the Contra program, including Adolfo Calero's brother-in-law, caught smuggling cocaine into this country using the national security uh, shield or passes, using telephone numbers from the past from the, from the White House to get themselves cleared when FBI or DEA officers would come down on them. We claim the Sandinistas were responsible for terrorism in, in, in Central America. And this case, of course, has never been made. Meanwhile, however, the United States has been supporting with literally billions of dollars the activities of death squads that were slaughtering people brutally in countries like El Salvador and Guatemala. And we've been blaming the Sandinistas for the misery in Nicaragua. And the country is miserable. They say no high. We don't have everything. There are shortages of everything. The country is suffering. But U.S. representatives go down there and have a look and come back and go on television and say, you won't believe the place. It's the most miserable country I've ever visited. The Sandinistas have not been able to manage it. Look what happens when you have a Marxist government. To be honest, obviously, they would go down and say, our stated purpose back since 1982 was to break the Nicaraguan economy. We spent a billion dollars destabilizing the country to break its economy. Now, here are my snapshots of the results of our successful program to break their economy. Of course, they don't do that because they're playing propaganda, because they're not being honest. The country is miserable. It's not the fault of the Sandinistas. It was the purpose of our Contra program. And then there's the Soviet threat. President Reagan saying all those years, you know, that we were having Soviets in our own backyard. He used to like to say there were Russians flying airplanes in this hemisphere, meaning into Nicaragua, for the first time in all of history. And like much of what he said, you know, his mind didn't work clearly on all three cylinders at best. <laughs> Like much of what he said, this was not accurate. Anyone who would think for a minute would note that Aeroflot has been flying into Canada, into Mexico, into Latin America, into New York City for 30 or 40 years on a daily basis, not to mention flying in and out of Cuba continuously. So the statement simply was not true. But again, altogether, over this period of time, we spent a billion dollars to destabilize this country. You can only you can only weep to think what could have been done with that money to build schools and clinics and irrigation projects in Nicaragua to create a healthy country, 
To this date, they have not committed an act of war against us or broken relations with us. We could go in now and reverse this program and work with them to alleviate suffering instead of to make people suffer. Now they've sent the Contras back into the country, they being George Bush and the CIA managers. They are still providing them with what they call humanitarian aid. And in a war situation, there is no humanitarian aid for the combatants. You're buying uniforms and boots and, and food for them, while private sources give them arms. They've sent several thousand of these troops into the country now to resume the military activities to destabilize the country as it goes into its second election process. And when Ortega has, has said we can't have a ceasefire if they're killing people in the country as they're doing, then we attack them and say, see, it's all their fault as we've been doing throughout. This thing that happened in Costa Rica last week where George Bush was down there for a meeting and he met with Ortega and Ortega announced that he would have to, to to, to nullify the ceasefire and put his troops back into trying to maintain the peace was the, George Bush's reaction was the ugliest thing, I, I mean viscerally, in terms of the dignity of a world leader that I recall seeing since Lyndon Johnson was president of this country as a Texan, I can say that. He was not a graceful man. Bush, with an ugly look on his face, referred to this little man in his green uniform breaking up our garden party. And Ortega eventually replied, and then he kept saying, us democratically elected leaders, and he's coming in here breaking up our garden party. Now, he didn't bother to mention, and I must say the media, working like silly putty uh, to his lead, nobody said at the time, none of the commentators said at the time, but President Bush, do you, do you forget, Ortega was also democratically elected. And no one stood up and said, yes, but people are dying in Nicaragua. What can he do? Instead, George Bush was lashing out at him and continues to do so. And the leading candidate against the Sandinistas, against Ortega in the next elections, is none other than Violeta Chamorro, a longtime CIA agent affiliated with La Prensa newspaper that was on the CIA payroll throughout the 80s, like Anastasio Somoza, Napoleon Duarte in El Salvador, Roberto Dobuisson in El Salvador, Manuel Noriega in Panama, the Shah of Iran, Mobutu and Zaire, this woman is a CIA agent who is now being run for open office in Nicaragua. Meanwhile, moving on from Nicaragua to the rest of the world, but keeping all of this in mind as a case study, we have the Church Committee report of 1975 in which we were, we were told that the countries. That's a lot of mischief. Every covert operation, of course, rationalized in terms of national security or anti-communism. We've got lots and lots and lots of these out in the public record. The world is only so big, these things are never completely secret. You can read for yourselves at great length about these things. We've set out to overthrow functioning constitutional democracies in over 20 countries. We manipulated elections in dozens of countries. We created standing armies and directed them to fight. We went after to organize ethnic minorities to encourage them to revolt. The first thing we did in Nicaragua was to go to the Mosquito Indians, who had never gotten along with the other people in Nicaragua very well, and give them more money than they had seen in the entirety of history, and arms and training and rationales and sanctuaries in Honduras, and sent them into Nicaragua to attack, kill, fight, rape, burn, pillage, and this is an insidious thing. Every society is torn with racial conflicts and conflicts with minorities. Think how violent our nation is. Think what if there were a super, super power so big that we didn't dare even flap back or strike back at them that were coming to our minorities with huge sums of money and arms and, and, and training people from our minority groups and sending them into the country to do open acts of violence how we would rise up and the bloodbath that would ensue. And this has been a technique the CIA has used in Nicaragua, in Thailand, in Vietnam, in Laos, in the Congo, in, in Iran, Iraq with the Kurds in different parts of the world. We created, trained, and funded death squads like the Treasury Police in El, Suel El Salvador, 
that are responsible for killing as many as 70,000 people, according to the count of the Catholic Church. And we've assassinated world leaders, including the United States President in 1963, and I'll get to that in more detail in just a moment. Getting back to the subject of democracy, since that, that's something that Bush and everyone is talking about right now, uh, I remind you of Chile. In 1973, the CIA organized the overthrow of Salvador Allende, the democratically elected president of Chile. And he was killed in the process, and we killed General Schneider, who was the pro-U.S. defender of the Constitution there, in order to put the CIA's representative Pinochet in power. And Henry Kissinger's, when he was grilled by the Congress over this program, his rationale was, yes, the issues are much too important for the Chilean voters to be left to decide for themselves. Now, there was a long CI destabilization and propaganda campaign against China. We were parachuting teams from Kemoi, Matsu, uh, Tibet, Burma, Thailand to destabilize China with the propaganda campaign. The propaganda aimed at the United States as well as uh, China and other parts of the world until eventually we talked ourselves into the Korean War in which a million people were, where we fought China and Korea and a million people were killed. There was a long CIA destabilization and propaganda campaign against Vietnam until we talked ourselves into going into Vietnam to fight and two million people were killed. Again, read for yourselves. Read Bill Blum's book, The CIA of Forgotten History. Read Portrait of a Cold Warrior by Joseph Burkholder Smith, who was a CIA case officer in Southeast Asia. Read Fire in the Lake by Frances Fitzgerald, the daughter of Desmond Fitzgerald, the famous CIA chief of operations of Southeast Asia. Read Deadly Deceits by Ralph McGeehy, another case officer who served in Southeast Asia. Read Decent Interval by Frank Snap, who covered the period of time in Vietnam, 73, 75. He and I were colleagues there at that time. Or if you will, read my own book, In Search of Enemies by Norton, which remains the only insider's detailed account of the, of the inner functionings of a covert action. Or read Washington's War on Nicaragua by Holly Sklar, not written by an insider, but a remarkable detail on the Nicaraguan operation, great detail of how that operation has been run. Trying to come to grips with these CIA activities and these broad numbers, trying to figure out how many people have been killed, you can count it up different ways. You can never be sure how many people are killed in the jungles of, of Laos or the hills of Nicaragua. But adding them up as best we can, we come up with a figure of six million people killed, minimum figure. It has to be more than that. A million in the Korean War, two million in the Vietnam War, 800,000 in Indonesia, a couple of million in Cambodia, 20,000 in Angola, the operation I was part of, 22,000 in Nicaragua. Again, the figure the New York Times cites. You're dealing with large numbers of people who died who would not have died if our tax dollars had not been spent by the CIA to exacerbate situations and destabilize and set people to fighting. So you began to analyze these figures to figure out who, who, who are these six million people we've killed. And again, that's a minimum figure. The conservatives tell us it's a dangerous world. Our enemies have to die so we can be safe and secure. Some of them say, I'm sorry about that, but that's the way the world is. We have to accept this reality. So you begin to study these things and rip through them and analyze them and break them apart and you find some shocking common denominators come out to you. Namely, for example, since 1954 we do not parachute teams into the Soviet Union to destabilize the country in a brutal way. Coincidentally, 1954 was the first year the Soviets developed their actual capability of actually dropping atomic weapons on the United States. Uh, for other reasons, we don't do these things in England, France, Sweden, Norway, Belgium, Switzerland, etc. These things are all done in countries of the third world where the governments don't have the power to force the United States to stop destabilizing the country and brutalizing their people. These six million people killed are people of the Mitumba Mountains of the Congo and the jungles of Southeast Asia and the hills of northern Nicaragua. Conspicuously, they're people who don't have ICBMs or armies or navies. They don't have any capability of doing physical hurt to the United States. The 22,000 killed in Nicaragua, for example, they're conspicuously not Russians. They're not Cuban soldiers or advisors. They're not even percentage-wise mostly Sandinistas. They're mostly rag-poor peasants, including a high percentage of women and children. 
communists? I'm sorry, they're mostly Roman Catholics. Enemies of the United States? I can't give you that one either because we have all these witnesses who've gone down to live in their villages with them and they invariably come back to testify that the Nicaraguans are the warmest people on the face of the earth and they love people from the United States and they simply cannot understand why we would want, our leaders would want to rationalize spending a billion dollars on a contra force to go into their villages to kill them and mutilate them while their families are forced to watch. Meanwhile, CIA activities, of course, have taken their own, left their own permanent mark on U.S. society. The MK Ultra program, I'll talk about it in greater detail if you like in the question and answer. We don't have full detail about this, but we have enough to know enough to be thoroughly chilled by it. The pro-agency book, The Agency, by John Rainlay, which is the memoirs of CIA founders Larry Houston, Ray Klein, and others, says that there were 175 different projects in that one program. We know of about five of them. These were experimentations with swine fever, with dengue fever, with deadly diseases, with psychedelic drugs, on American population groupings without their permission in many cases. If you were reading the newspapers in October of 1988, you noticed that there was a settlement declared between the CIA and the victims at McGill University in Canada where the CIA had been working with a mad psychiatrist who was taking the patients who came to him for help and shooting them up with hallucinogenic drugs to experiment with their minds instead of healing them. And this was a CIA program for which, with your tax dollars, we eventually paid damages to the, to the victims. Read for yourselves again, as I say, read The Agency by John Rainley, Read Clouds of Secrecy by Leonard Cole, a professor from Rutgers, and you find that this program is still going on today. Read In Search of the Manchurian Candidate by John Marks, published by New York Times Press in 1979, based on 14,000 documents gotten out of the, the CIA under the Freedom of Information Act. Or go through the back issues of Covert Action Information Bulletin, which has a dozen solid articles about this program. Colonel White, one of the founders of this program, one of the founders of the CIA, retiring about the time I went in in the mid-60s, wrote from retirement a letter about uh, to a friend and then agreed to have it published. Why not, he said. And so we have it in his handwriting. He wrote, I toiled wholeheartedly in the vineyards because it was fun, fun, fun. Where else could a red-blooded American boy lie, kill, cheat, steal, rape, and pillage? with the blessings of the all highest. Then we have the MH Chaos program and the COINTEL Pro program, CI and FBI programs, where they were manipulating student and labor organizations and civic organizations, disrupting them, trying to redirect them. We have the findings of the church committee that they were getting journalists, up to about 200 journalists, including some of the biggest names in the business, and getting them to cooperate with the CI to put its propaganda into our media so that we would be influenced with misunderstandings of what was happening in Southeast Asia, or Korea, or Vietnam, or China, or Central America, other parts of the world that our government wanted to destabilize and attack and fight wars. Co-opting professors to work with the CIA to, ma to manipulate student groups and build files on students. Publishing 1,200 books in which they were paying professors, scholars, journalists to write books in their names and these books are still in our libraries today because the church committee couldn't force the CIA to reveal the titles, CIA propaganda, so that if you're doing your dissertation on the Vietnam War, for example, probably one or two dozen of the books that you'll have in your bibliography, if not more, will in fact be CIA propaganda, and you can only guess and try to discern which is which. And this is not ancient history. FBI Director William Sessions announced about this time last year that he was disciplining officers that he found had been improperly targeting CSPES and 160 other civic organizations. And this summer, the Congressional Committee said there were a total of 1,600 groups that had been targeted and listed, as they say, uh, improperly by the FBI. Uh, again, the same type of programs as the M MH Chaos and COINTEL Pro programs. And that's just FBI. The CIA was doing the same thing during the same period of time, but there's been no confession or revelation of what they were doing, nor has there been a publication of the lists of the names of the, the groups that were targeted. 
So if you had trouble in one of your groups, uh, you can only guess if it was because of FBI or CI disruption or just pure and simply human foible. Drugs. Every major area of operation in which the CI has worked has left behind a major functioning drug cartel. Again, this is a major subject we could talk about all night. I'll just mention it. We can go back to it in detail if you like in the question and answer. The French connection grew directly from the OSS, the CIA's predecessors, getting Lucky Luciano out of prison and funding him to activate the mafia to work with the U.S. forces during the war and then right after the war to break up the strikes on the docks in Marseille. The Golden Triangle in Southeast Asia grew directly out of our covert policies there before it had been run by French intelligence with the Corsican Mafia. We took over with our Air America and civil air transport planes flying in arms to our allies, flying back out with the heroin. The first target being U.S. GIs during the Vietnam War, the second target being the United States itself. The Golden Crescent. Afghanistan, of course, is the largest covert operation the CIA has run to date. We understand in terms of the hundreds of millions of dollars it's cost going on for over a year. And sure enough, after about six years, the Golden Crescent in that area becomes the largest source of heroin in the world today. And then again, to mention the Medellin Colombian cocaine cartel getting the big surge of its activities during the 80s, the importation of cocaine, uh, in 1981, according to, to the DEA, being 1,000 kilograms, jumping to 35,000 kilograms, a little over 35 tons in 1987, while we have, again, the findings of the Kerry Committee, the findings of investigative journalists, the massive overlapping between the Contra program and, and the Medellin smuggling drugs into this country. The beauty of it being that the Contras the people who were running the Contra program for the CIA were eminently corruptible and the planes would fly down with arms and come back to our National Guard and Air Force bases where they had CIA clearances. So they could lead, land at Homestead and then have passes to you know, load onto the trucks and clear the bases without being stopped. And when they would be stopped, or someone like Leon Kellner, the attorney down in, in Florida trying to prosecute, word would come down from the Attorney General's, of, from the attorney general's office uh, to tell them that it was national security that they should not try to prosecute this thing. Even Adolfo Calero's brother-in-law uh, caught uh, involved in, in the importation of 200 uh, kilograms of cocaine into this country and not prosecuted again because they said it involved U.S. national security, namely the destabilization of Nicaragua. See for yourselves. If you'd like to get your information from video, see Guns, Drugs, and the CIA, the Frontline PBS show, or read for yourselves. Read The Great Heroin Coup by Henry Kruger. Read The Iran-Contra Connection by Peter Dale Scott. Read The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia by Al McCoy. Read The Cocaine Wars by Paul Eddy. Read Out of Control by Leslie Coburn. Read Mafia Kingfish by John Davis. Read The Senator Must Die by Bob Morrow. Eighty percent of the people in this country have been polled for some time when they're pinned down. Do you believe that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in killing John Kennedy or was there a conspiracy? Eighty percent of the people have been saying there had to be a conspiracy. But we were saying this without having the facts, without being able to say what kind of a conspiracy, who was behind it. Now we have the facts out in abundant detail. This, uh, by the mid, by the spring of 1963, the liberal President John Kennedy had antagonized a number of powerful and very ugly uh, forces in this country. The CIA's O.P. Mongoose, J.M. Wave Group out of Florida that had been attacking Cuba like the Contras in Nicaragua with lots of atrocities and vicious activities and a program to assassinate leaders including Fidel Castro. They hated Kennedy because the Bay of Pigs fiasco, although it was their fault, it was bungled, they blamed him for not sending in the Marines to bail them out. And they hated him for that and they hated him for making a deal with the Russians to have the Russian missiles withdrawn from Cuba with the promise that we would not invade Cuba. And also at the same time, because of that deal, Kennedy was shutting down their destabilization contra-type program 
uh, to going from Florida into Cuba, and they hated him for that. They were very angry, and they were armed, and they were practiced and trained at military-type ambushes. The right-wing military was angry because Kennedy had decided to pull us out of the Vietnam War. The conservative Dallas businessmen were angry because he was moving to terminate the oil depletion allowances that had made them so terrifically rich over a period of years. The Deep South was becoming enraged because this was an era of deep segregation and he was beginning to say, we've got to let go, we've got to loosen up, we've got to stop the segregation in the South. And some very heavy people were very, ang very angry and fighting, killing mad about that. And the Mafia was embattled. John Kennedy, the President, and his brother, Bobby, the Attorney General, had for years been waging a war against the Mafia, trying to put the leaders in jail, throwing Carlos Marcello, the Don from New Orleans, out of the country, going after them in a serious, systematic way. And it turned out that there were numerous threats and indications of the Mafia's plans to kill the Kennedy brothers, uh, the war as they saw it, uh, between themselves and the Kennedy brothers. So what happened was a team of what they call CIA renegades, because it wasn't the coat and tie people inside the building like myself and David McMichael, I think, is sitting in the back, CIA officers who were of the establishment inside. It was the renegades down in Florida who were working uh, this, this, this destabilization activity against Cuba working with Cuban exiles, overlapping greatly with the Mafia, which was involved in this flow of drugs from Cuba into the United States. These people plotted a military-style ambush in Dallas, and they set up a team of shooters on the top of buildings. They had the cooperation of someone in the Secret Service. They had the cooperation of the Dallas police. They got the parade route redirected. They got Kennedy into this the cars into this place where we would have to make a 120 degree turn. The Secret Service driver stopped when the bullets began flying and anyone who's been through that kind of training, and I've been through their bang and burn courses, they drill it into you that when the bullets start flying in a situation like you have a president or yourself or something, you mash down on the gas and you get the hell out of there, you don't stop and look around as a seasoned Secret Service driver did in fact. And Kennedy was shot down short distances from shooting stations, probably four of them, firing probably seven shots. He was hit twice, once in the back, once in the front of the neck, and twice in the head. Connolly was hit once or twice. Two bullets were fired on each side of the thing. The convoy then blasted away and got out of there. Immediately, the FBI launched the cover-up, the announced purpose by the people in the establishment being to prove to reassure, as they put it, the nation that it was the work of the lone assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald. The evidence was tampered with massively. The president's body was altered. The photographs of the autopsy were, al were altered. And 49 witnesses were killed so they could not blow the whistle and testify and blow this thing open until this day, despite the fact that the House Committee in 1979 concluded that it was a conspiracy there has been no formal investigation by the Justice Department of the conspiracy to kill our president. This was nothing less than a coup d'etat. They were faced, they the conservatives, the ones that hated John Kennedy, were faced with his re-election and possibly his brothers after that, and they could not be bothered to wait for democracy to take its course, so they plotted an ambu ambush and they killed him, and their choice, the, a man who was playing ball with them, who was accepting money from the mob, Lyndon Johnson, moved right into to the presidency. And the oil depletion allowance, the Vietnam War, the essential things they wanted, uh, they got immediately. The crusade against organized crime was dropped. And world went on as they wanted it to, according to their wishes, without their having to bother with an election. Read for yourselves. We've got a number of meticulously researched books out on the market now and a bunch of people who are determined to bring this out and finally, two and a half decades later, make it clear to the people that the government must sooner or later face the truth and go after and punish the people who are responsible for assassinating our president. Read High Treason by Groden and Livingston. Read The Senator Must Die or Betrayal by Bob Morrow. Read On the Trail of the Assassin by Jim Garrison. 
Read Contract on America, the best uh, bestseller that's afoot today by David Scheim. Read Mafia Kingfish by John Davids. Read Gumshoe by Josiah Thompson. Read Reasonable Doubt by H. Hurt. Read Best Evidence by David Lifton. Read Secrecy and Power, The Life of J. Edgar Hoover by Richard Powers. Among other things, you'll find that J. Edgar Hoover, the FBI director, was a major hoodlum. He was the master of blackmail in this country. Everyone in Washington knew it. He was building files on senators and Congress people. If they crossed him, they would be exposed. If they tried to force an investigation of the FBI, they would be exposed personally. If they tried to force investigations of the mafia, they would be exposed. Richard Nixon had mob ties dating back to his first election campaign in California. Lyndon Johnson, anyone down in Texas could tell you that his campaigns were very dirty. And now we come to the breathtaking scandal of having this man, Manuel Noriega, who's a former paid CIA agent under six presidents. That's according to George Bush. He revealed that information in the presidential debates with Michael Dukakis. This man, Noriega, the dictator of Panama, an indicted drug dealer, boasting that he has blackmail control over George Bush, the United States president. I refer you to the Newsweek May 23, 1988 issue, in which it's about Noriega. It concludes with Noriega's quote, quotation marks, I have George Bush by the balls. This may help you understand why of all the dictators in the world who are smuggling drugs, who are not very nice, who have manipulated elections, why George Bush has a fixation on Noriega. He's got a problem there. Uh, he's got to keep the pressure on Noriega, else if Noriega ever got some credibility working, who knows what might happen in our own legal system up here. I worked for George Bush personally at the end of the Angolan operation when he was CIA director in 1976. Uh, we had broken the law and we had perjured ourselves to cover it up. We being Henry Kissinger and Bill Colby, mostly me being in a staff position under them. Bush's policies were not to find out the truth and punish the perpetrators and clean up the CIA. It was to cover for us. He went to the congressional committees and said, I wasn't here, but these nice people I'm meeting, he's a very nice person, by the way. He would walk down the hall shaking our hands saying, hello, I'm George Bush, and I want you to know I love being here working with all these fine people in the CIA. And we were saying, huh? I mean, this is the CIA director who's supposed to have kind of an aura, you know. And, but he was going to the Congress saying, I can't believe that these nice people out there would do the things that you're alleging, but I'll check. And then he had, but, and then he had a young attorney sent down to my office to go through my files to purge them of documents that would prove exactly what they were accusing us of. And then he went back to them and said, we've checked, there are no files in the agency that, that prove anything like you're alleging, therefore you can drop it, and they did. In the Orlando Letelier killing, this is a bombing in Washington Square in our capital done by CIA or former CIA agents with DINA agents from the Chilean service. He immediately went to the Justice Department and asked them to soft pedal it because he said it involved sensitive relationships with other countries, meaning the service in Chile, a bombing in this capital, and he wants to cover it up. He also went to the veterans of the OP Mongoose destabilization of Cuba. When Johnson had shut that program down, or Kennedy had shut it down and Johnson had let it die, these people had turned to drug smuggling and murder and bombing, shooting bazookas at, air, at ships coming into the Miami Harbor, uh, stuff like that, out of control. He went to them and said, look, the pressure is mounting, you've got to get your act out of the country. And in June of 76, they went to the, the Dominican Republic and had a meeting and formed this Kourou group planning their activities, counter-revolutionary unit. And in October 6 of 1976, they blew up an airplane that was taking off from Barbados, killing 73 passengers on board in a raw act of terrorism. Luis Posada Carillas and Orlando Bosch were jailed in Venezuela for being the authors of that bombing. We have classified testimony before the Senate Church Committee and before the House Assassination Committee that Orlando Bosch was also a member of the team that killed President Kennedy. And in the Iran-Contra scandal, we have a very curious, 
and awesome and awful situation where the vice president was supposedly in charge of an anti-drug task force, where he got involved in the Contra program, where he had this man Don Gregg, a longtime CIA officer working as his national security advisor. And Gregg had a relationship with Felix Rodriguez, who was one of the Bay of Pigs veterans, one of the drug smuggling, destabilizing people working against Cuba, uh, who was with Don Gregg in MR3 in Vietnam, my military region in Vietnam, although we did not overlap there. They were there before I got there. Bush has Don Gregg working for him, and they placed Felix Rodriguez in Ilopango in El Salvador, where he's in charge of, and we have the documents proving that he was involved in primarily working with the Contra Air Force, and these were the planes that were flying the drugs, the arms to the Contras, and the drugs back to the United States. We have testimony before our courts and evidence in the trial of Millan Rodriguez that they delivered, they being Millan, laundering money for the Medellin, delivered $10 million to the Contras through Felix Rodriguez, buying access to this air wing. Now, these people got Luis Posada Carillas out of prison in Venezuela. Felix Rodriguez told the press, he said, we needed him. He's a good man. And they got Luis Posada Carillas out of Venezuela to help them with this program. And this man was the terrorist who was involved in blowing up the passenger plane that was taking off from Barbados. And he's working for Felix Rodriguez, who is reporting directly to the vice president's office. Vice President George Bush's office and flying up to report in person and going into Bush's office to report. Bush says he doesn't remember they're ever talking about the Contra program or anything down in Central America. They were talking about their lunch or dinner or something. See, the trouble with this is that with Ronald Reagan, you really could believe that he didn't understand when people briefed him. The man's mind skipped in and out, as everyone well knew. But George Bush is an intelligence person. It's very difficult to believe that he would not be mentally involved in these things. But even if by chance they did talk about lunch or breakfast, when it became clear, we brought it out in the media vigorously, and the Congress discussed it, that a known terrorist was working one step up the chain or down the chain of command from him, reporting into his office, uh, he did not purge himself of these associations. To the contrary, he went on. And, and nominated Don Gregg to be ambassador to Korea, where I believe he is today. One might speculate, going back to Noriega's boast, that George Bush could not separate himself from these people because of what they would know of their involvement with him going back to the CIA days and to the activities when he was vice president working with them. Looking at George Bush's policies now, he's been in office a few months, and we can begin to measure the personality of his presidency. He's maintaining a slightly lower, less noisy profile than Ronald Reagan, but he's continuing his policies across the globe. Bush has refused the Soviet's offer for both superpowers to abstain from delivering arms to the combatants in Afghanistan. He has asked for military aid for the Contras in Nicaragua so they could continue fighting. He is pressing ahead with vigorous plans to interfere with the elections in Nicaragua. That's exactly what's happening now when these Contras are going back across the border in uniform with their weapons to disrupt the elections in Nicaragua today. He has already interfered with the elections in Panama. As you recall, the Congress allocated $10 million for the purpose of disrupting those elections. He encouraged a disastrous coup d'etat in Panama that blew up, I must say, in his own face. He's delivering arms through Thailand into Kampuchea, destabilizing that country that hasn't had a moment's peace for 25 years. And he's continuing to deliver arms to Jonas Savimbi in Angola, including Stinger missiles, ground-to-air missiles, after Savimbi has boasted openly of shooting down passenger planes. And he's continued military support for the death squads in El Salvador. And under the guise of the drug war, he's putting U.S. military into Latin America where they're doing the same thing in countries like they've been doing in El Salvador, flying planes, strafing, and rocketing villages. Meanwhile, despite Glasnost, the Soviet record is not all that much better. They're continuing to pump arms into Afghanistan and Kampuchea. They're increasing expenditures on their military. In fact, Glasnost was not intended to benefit the third world. The impetus behind Glasnost was Soviet economic problems, not sympathy for the third world. If you go back and read Andrei Kozirov's article in the New York Times on, the, on January 7 of 1989, you find he's calling 
for the Soviet Union to join with the United States in the capitalist solution in supporting the status quo and what they call stability in countries of the world in the interest of world trade in which the Soviet Union uh, would become more active. And we find the most shocking thing of all to date is that today Soviet attack helicopters designed for the fighting in Afghanistan are now being used in joint operations with U.S. military and Peruvian military in Peru to strafe and rocket villagers there. Meanwhile, you've got to be screaming, why? What is the purpose of all this? And I promised you I'd bring it all together and show you how these things interrelate. And in a very few minutes, I propose to do that so we can get on to the question and answer period, which is really the most fun part where you can direct you know, your interest in these things. Why would we spend billions of dollars to destabilize every corner of the globe for four or five decades? Economics. I mean, it's a complex world. There are lots of reasons. There are people who do these things just because they think they're fun, to blow things up and kill people. Uh, but economics, the biggest stuff. Billion dollar drug trade speaks for itself. The, third, the second most profitable industry in the world, of course, is the production of arms. Three billion dollars a day bought and sold of weapons. The defense corporations making 20 to 24 percent profit. We just got through spending a total of 2.2 trillion dollars on the largest arms buildup perhaps in the history of the world, certainly of any peacetime arms buildup. And our debt increasing by just about exactly the same amount during that period of time. The result is that we've created a society that's dominated by what President Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex. The U.S. taxpayer is now carrying a gigantic burden. One-third of our budget about is for the military. Fifty-three cents, according to the Washington Post, of every tax dollar goes to the military. We begin the conditioning to war in this country, this permanent war complex we maintain, pretending we're good guys at the age of two. This is the age at which we put our children in front of the one-eyed babysitter and turn it on so we can go wash the dishes or take a break. And they watch the same show with different characters 10 or 15 times a day. And I'm talking about, I have a kid, so I'm into these things. You know, He-Man and Sheena and Scooby-Doo even and the, the Transformers and the Decepticons and what each one of these nice little people put upon by ugly evil forces always saying please be nice the evil forces insist on attacking and at the last minute the good guys rise up and stomp them down cut commercial and we move on you know to the next show until it's estimated when we graduate from high school we spent more time watching violence on television than we've spent in the classrooms itself and then you get into the movies we've been feeding ourselves during this military buildup during the 80s. Rambo, Commando, Red Dawn, the Rocky series, under, under Siege, Delta Force, America, Missing in Action, Top Gun, Heartbreak Ridge, Death Before Dishonor, Platoon, Hamburger Hill, Tour of Duty, China Beach, and they go on and on. How many people saw the movie Red Dawn, by the way? This is fun. Don't be embarrassed. It's a great movie. Now, this, this story, it's science fiction. The producer of this movie went on television around the nation saying it was his purpose to create a movie that would make people, that would draw people back to war, that would make them feel war could be a good and exciting thing. And this film was actually shown in Marine boot camps uh, to motivate people and to National Guard groups that were about to go down to train in Honduras for the possible invasion of Nicaragua. The science fiction is that they have a force, as you recall, of Russians, Cubans, and Nicaraguans who've invaded the United States and they've gotten all the way to the Rocky Mountains. Uh, now, you ask yourself why the planning as they did the movie, why did they pick Russians, Cubans, and Nicaraguans? I mean, it would be a better movie if they picked Russians, Canadians, and Cubans. See, because, because Canada is an industrial country and there's a huge border and there could be the Russians coming across at a hundred places and pinning us against Cuba. I mean, you could kind of get your head in. I mean, it's all science fiction, you know, blow off our nuclear weapons and our army and all of that. This is the given. So why did they pick Nicaragua instead of, say, Canada? And the answer is, of course, they were targeting Nicaragua for a possible invasion by U.S. troops. So they had to condition the people that Nicaragua would be the next enemy, the next target. Anyway, this force gets all the way to the Rocky Mountains where they're eventually stopped by the high school football team. <laughs> now. 
Now, I submit to you that the 80s you see is the decade of the middle-aged women. This is, you know, Dallas and Dynasty and the Golden Girls and Murder, She Wrote. Linda Evans, you know, is in better physical condition than I am. And Joan Collins is older than I am. And she's a sex symbol. And the, the Nautilus workouts and the jogging. I mean, an 80s movie would have been the, the Soviets, Cubans, and Nicaraguans with middle-aged school teachers running through the mountains and shooting them down and drinking deer's blood and all of that. So why did they pick the high school football team? You see, the answer is obvious. They're going to fight the next war with the 18-year-olds and 19-year-olds. It's not going to be the middle-aged 50-year-olds. We're too smart. We've seen the cynicism of war. We wouldn't buy it. It's at that age, the high school graduates, where the young men are suffering from their massive doses of testosterone poisoning. And their minds have not yet had a chance to be filled, for all of them, some are precautious, but many of them have not yet had a chance to fill their minds with experience, to understand what the world is all about, to understand how they're being used. So that's why they targeted that film at the high school. And then you look at the ads on television that were pumping at us then and now. Join the army, be all that you can be with these tanks jumping ditches and helicopters going 200 miles an hour. And these things are great. I watch them and come up on the edge of my chair. And we didn't have tanks like that when David and I were in the Marine Corps. They would jump a little ditch and break down. <laughs> and, and, and they were not computerized. And they, you know, they didn't go in the helicopters went about 80 miles an hour and not 200 miles an hour. And so, you know, then I say, wait a minute, what's going on here? What's missing, you know? Where are the young men with their legs blown off at the knees, with their intestines wrapped around their necks? And the answer is that these things are not meant to educate. See, that's where they're reaching inside people's breasts and pressing buttons and manipulating people to join the army and be all that you can be and be available to be sent down to Central America to kill people and to die for your country. And then there's the most insidious ad I think I've seen uh, in all of the days that I've watched television. This is the one of the soldier coming home on, on vacation in uniform, handsome young man. He's met by his brother. I think he's getting off a train. And he says, Dad never did understand why I joined the Army. And then they're driving and he says, Do you think you'll ever forgive me? And the, the boy says, Well, you know Dad. And then they get in the living room and the young soldier says, Dad. And the father turns and hugs him and all is forgiven. Now what's the point? They must have spent hundreds of millions of dollars on this ad. What's the point? The point you see is that there are a lot of fathers in this country that are saying do not join the army. They've seen the Vietnam War and the Korean War and they've seen the cynicism and they're telling their sons not to join the army and this ad is saying that it's okay according to the values of U.S. society to defy your father and join the army. Now, the result of course of, of this runaway arms race that we've got going with this expenditure, giant expenditures on the military is that we can't afford it. We're having to cut every conceivable social service. We can't afford to care for the old people or the poor people or the handicapped people or the farmers or to help the young people get through college. And we're gutting social security to cover the deficit. I repeat, you and I, if you've got a job, we're taxed, the FICA tax, it's 15%. Your employer pays 7.5%. If you're self-employed like me, you pay all 15%. Uh, and this is your retirement. You're supposed to get that back when you're 65. And they're spending that money like it was windfall profits to cover the deficit that they've run up on the production of arms. The real deficits are running about $300 billion. They're calling them $152 billion. The difference they're claiming against borrowing against the Social Security Retirement Fund that belongs to us. And they're spending it on their military today. What's happening is that the United States has plunged relative to the, less, the rest of the world. 25% of the people in this country are now functionally illiterate. We're sixth in the world in terms of the percentage of children in school. We're tenth in the world in quality of education. We're seventh in the world in terms of life expectancy. We're twentieth in the world in terms of infant mortality. To sell these sacrifices to the American people, the world has to be hostile and dangerous. If the world were peaceful, we would never put up with this kind of expenditure on arms. These thousands of CI destabilizations have the function of killing people who never were our enemies, but the effect of leaving behind for each one of them perhaps five loved ones who are now 
traumatically conditioned to violence to ensure that the world will go on being violent and in each one of them leaving behind the Contras and the Cuban exiles and the people in Southeast Asia and elsewhere that we trained into this brutality to guarantee that the world will go on being brutal to justify this giant arms scam and keep it going. Meanwhile, even if the morality of all this and the damage to our nation doesn't bother you, we've got to take a serious look at this. The, the arms race is breaking the economies of both of the superpowers. The multinational defense corporations have no great loyalty to the United States. They are no longer U.S. corporations. They make enormous profits and invest the money overseas. They are quite willing to sell the U.S. economy down the drain in order to make their profits. While the United States is producing MX missiles which you put in the ground which can never be used and most significantly they can never be traded to countries overseas, our allies, not our enemies, are producing Sonys and Toyotas and passing us by in the trade deficits and we're plunging deep into debt. To take a beautiful and clear simple example, President Reagan spent more money on his more presidential energy on his Contra program against Nicaragua than any other aspect of the presidency. He spent more time talking publicly about his Contras than any other aspect of the presidency. His Contra program in Nicaragua, Nicaragua a country with two elevators while Japan was proceeding to capture 30 percent of the international overseas exchange and the United States became a debtor nation for the first time since World War I with the greatest debt in the history of the world. The second reason that we've got to take a long hard look at this system of doing business is because the result of a runaway arms race is the production of arms. We've saturated with the world booby trapped it as Carl Sagan says with 60,000 thermonuclear weapons. In 1981 we had the capability of destroying utterly 80, 80 Soviet unions, of rendering 20 planets uninhabitable. Now, despite the INF Treaty, the world is four times as dangerous as it was in 1981. The U.S. and the USSR have effected a 40% increase in the numbers of their strategic weapons, and they've made them more modern and more efficient. The U.S. is currently racing to deploy the B-1B bomber, the B-2 bomber, the MX missile, the Trident II missiles, and the Star Wars programs. Meanwhile, the Soviet Union is deploying 3,300 more, more accurate, more sophisticated strategic weapons that can target any corner of the United States. And the Soviet Union now, the makers of the Chernobyl plant, are marketing a nuclear reactor for use in space. Any country wants to buy one, they'll sell them one. And there are nine other countries rushing to join the nuclear club. And they tell us these things are fail-safe. We don't have to worry about them. And even if you don't have time to read the books or the scientific articles or even the newspapers, if you've only read the headlines, you know that none of this stuff is fail-safe. Backing up a couple of years in one 12-month period of time, the Challenger 2 blew up, a Delta rocket blew up, two Titan missiles blew up, a French Ariane missile blew up, a Chernobyl plant melted down, and a Soviet SS-18 blew up, and that was not a particularly bad year. We've dropped seven bombs accidentally out of airplanes. I won't take the time to list them all, but the one over South Carolina we never found. And so they went in and bought a huge tract of the swamp land and declared it a nuclear restricted zone. And that bomb presumably is still there in that brackish water rusting, unless, of course, someone else has found it. Six submarines have sunk into the bottom of the ocean. We recovered two. And one of ours, one of theirs, at least four submarines down, twisted and rusting in the bottom of the ocean with their nuclear plants and nuclear weapons on board. The IPS reported last spring that there is debris from 50 nuclear reactors and nuclear weapons scattering the bottom of the ocean today. And we have hundreds of millions of gallons of radioactive waste that we have no idea what to do with that will still be toxic 50,000 years from now. And huge stockpiles of chemical and biological weapons and proceeding apace, integral into all of this. I haven't had the time to show the relationship, but I will if you want to ask in the question and answer, is the systematic destruction of our environment. Carl Sagan says a species divided against itself cannot survive. A planet divided against itself cannot survive. 
Eisenhower, as he was leaving office in a speech, said, the people of the world genuinely want peace. Someday the leaders of the world are going to have to give in and give it to them. Helen Caldicott, talking around the nation on this issue with some passion, says, get involved, your planet is at stake. It's terminally ill with this public health disease, which is the arms race. If we don't clean it up, the planet will die. And she notes, if you will get to work on it, you'll feel better about yourself and your planet and your environment and your life. And she notes very dramatically that if you do get involved in working on this problem, if the missiles start going off someday, and there's a few minutes before the one lands on your town, at least you can turn to your loved one and hug them and say, honey, at least we tried. Now, if I stop this right now, I would be doing you a great service uh, because, you know, it is such an awesome down subject, terrifying and disempowering. And yet people have done dramatic things over history to change uh, the way people interrelated with each other. Glasnost is a tentative, in some ways misguided, but nevertheless a step in the direction of people stopping this madness, stopping the arms race. That should give us hope. I'll just give you two quick examples, and then we'll go to the question and answer. One, these are carefully chosen. I've done a lot of reading on the subject of hope as well. One of these is the women's movement in this country. Eighty years ago, a man could put his sister's wife daughters to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week in factories and pocket their salaries. And if they didn't like it, he could beat them and there was nothing they could do about it. And that has changed to the evolving situation of women today, not by accident, but by the determined struggles of feminist activists. And the reason I select this example is they did it without cracking skulls. They did it without killing people. They did it without violence. My point is that if the problem is essentially testosterone poisoning, as Carl Sagan calls it, we're not going to solve the problem with more testosterone poisoning or more violence. We have to find on an evolutionary scale a new way for human beings to interrelate with each other uh, or we're going to self-destruct as a species. And the other example, we're all disempowered, we're all so helpless. The individual here in Washington or in Maine where I was a couple of nights ago, or in South Texas or California, uh, you know, what can I do? And it's a tough one. We're up against the power structure. We're up against the military industrial complexes with the media bought and woven right into the, thing, the things, and it's a tough one. But the professor who stopped the war is a wonderful, to me, inspiring example. My war in Angola then young professor Jerry Bender of UC San Diego who had done his studies in Angola and he saw what we were doing and they bothered him and he couldn't figure out what to do about it how could he stop it so one day he picked up the telephone and he called his senator and he said Senator Tunney I have an expertise on Angola I see what the CIA is doing I think they're lying to you I think it's dangerous I would like the opportunity to brief you I will not waste your time and the senator listened to him and came back to Washington and found that we were indeed lying to the Congress and he introduced the Tunney Amendment to the FY76 Defense Appropriation Act that stopped my war in Angola. Now some years ago I came to talk to Admiral Iraq at the Center for Defense Information here in Washington because I was way over my head to ask him, you know, people asked me, Admiral, I said, what can I do? And I don't know what to tell them specifically. And, and this beautiful old man, we were having breakfast at his home, and he stood up. He said, I love that question. He said, I tell people, I don't know you, but you know yourselves. You know what your capabilities are. He said, I tell people, if you can write, write articles, write letters, write books, write telegrams. If you can organize, organize. If you can travel, go to Nicaragua or, La or the Las Vegas test sites and see for yourself so you can be an intelligent witness to what's happening in the world. He said, and I quote, I tell people, if they feel comfortable lying down in front of bombs, trucks with bombs on them, to lie down in front of trucks with bombs on them. But, he said, I tell them, you've got to do what you can do every day of your life. You can't wait until you graduate next summer or get married or get divorced or get a job because these things malfunction all the time and they're controlled by, by intellectual giants like Ronald Reagan and the world may not be here by the time you graduate next summer or get divorced or get a job or whatever. Thank you very much for hearing me out. Thank you.
I just wanted to make a couple of announcements and then we'll open up the floor for question and answers. We have two mics in, the, in each aisle. And uh, if you have questions, uh, I encourage you to write them down, make them uh, succinct and clear, and then just stand at the mics and uh, wait your turn. Um, one of the announcements that I wanted to make is, um, if you're wondering about something that you can do, the CIA will be on the American University campus recruiting uh, December 1st. And uh, you can do something about that if you don't like that idea. Um, the deadline for um, getting an interview with the CIA is next Monday. Um, I would encourage each and every one of you to go and make an appointment with the CIA and talk with them and tell them what you think of them and tell them what you think about them being on American University campus. If you want an interview with the CIA, you need to go to the Butler Pavilion on the fourth floor in the Career Center and you need to bring 20 copies of your resume. Um, I hope you all go. Maybe if um, a whole lot of us go, they won't come back. The other things that... The other things I wanted to say is this, um, this lecture is being broadcast on C-SPAN nationwide. I can't tell you the dates right now, but um, it'll be probably more than once, and um, uh, you can look for that. Also, DC Cable, the Channel 34 Public Access Channel, will be broadcasting this lecture. Uh, we have the Covert Action Information Bulletin and other materials and books on sale behind you out these back doors. You can check those out after the question and answer. Um, the bibliography that's available, I'm going to put the address here on this um, chalkboard back here. Okay, back to John. Yes. Um, just a question. How did you come to see the light? And if you could just tell us briefly. Yeah. In terms of... I, I can tell you very briefly. I can also tell you that this is a subject of another lecture that I give. Uh, which we call uh, uh, getting in and getting out a career in the CIA with anecdotes of how they recruit you and how they train you and, and uh, the experiences that turn your mind around or did mine. And uh, in the briefest possible terms, people like myself, I know, of course, myself quite well, David, I know uh, pretty well, we're not people that change uh, easily. By the way, David, why don't you stand up? They should know who you are. David is an organizer in here in Washington who was in the Second Force Recon Company that I was in. He was a year or two ahead of me. Uh, we're not people that change easily. And we were conditioned by childhood experiences to believe that these were noble and right things to do, defending our country from the evils of this, that, and the other. Uh, I had to get into the CIA all that conditioning in the Marine Corps, all that conditioning in the CIA. I had to get into, uh, at the lower levels in the CIA, they keep the conditioning going. The cover stories, you don't talk punk talk, you don't talk goon talk, you don't send a cable to headquarters saying, send me out an assassin to knock off somebody. If you did, you'd get a, you, you would get put down, you'd get reprimanded. Uh, it's all very high-minded, there is some double speak. And at a certain level, operations are killing people, certainly. But uh, especially for the younger officers, they keep the myths going. Uh, I began to get a little higher. I never made it all the way to the top by any manner of means, but I did get into the management of three operations. I did get to be a chief of station where I was dealing with policy. I did get into a position in the Vietnam War in a key province where I saw the utter horror and debacle uh, and shamefulness of the CIA's evacuation from Vietnam. And I'll let that be a separate question. If someone asks that, I'll tell you about the evacuation from Vietnam and how the CIA chief of station was delivering our secrets to the uh, enemy and what happened to him after that. Uh, and then I came back to the States and was put in charge of the Angola Task Force, a big break for someone at the level of a GS-14, just like Ollie North, who was... Uh, Lieutenant Colonel, I was about the same grade with a similar background, except I had professional training, and I hope my gyroscope was bolted down solidly. His is missing a couple of key bolts down on the base, obviously, and wobbles a little bit. But nevertheless, 
uh, I found myself in a position where I was literally occupying the responsibilities of someone much older. A GS-17 would normally have had that job. Because the chief of Africa Division had been struck down with polio uh, and was somewhat immobile, he wanted to run this operation, but he literally needed, he had no paramilitary expertise, which I did, and he needed a good set of legs. And I was very young and energetic and jogging and lifting weights. And so we were kind of a team. And that put me on a subcommittee of the National Security Council running this operation internationally. Now, you can ask, in Vietnam, we left our employees behind in a scandalous way. And in many cases, we left the files behind that identified them. And this is something that no Marine officer could ever do and, and look himself in, in the mirror when he shaves anymore the rest of his life. And we did it. I fought it, but I was forced to do it and left the country leaving my people behind. So you can ask, you know, well, why did you take this next job? And without being melodramatic, I am not a brilliant person and I was much more confused then. So there was no brilliance in my decision, but quite literally I went out and sat on a rock in Great Falls Park out here and muddled about what should I do. And the one thing I just could not get out of my mind is after all these years in the field running operations that did not make sense in terms of national security, in terms of the benefits to the United States that were hurting people, it seemed needlessly, uh, I was being offered a job in the inner sanctum. Uh, where I would have access to every document that was written about the Angolan program and its rationales, every one copy, eyes only to the president, uh, memo, note, letter, uh, I would have access to, be part of. And I just couldn't resist it. If you want to, to dramatize it, you could, just, you could say I made a deal with the devil. I felt like I was joining something that would be evil and criminal, but I could not resist being inside. And then once I got inside, I had to see it through to the end. And I worked extremely hard. These jobs, this is something that North does not exaggerate when he was writing notes saying, someday I've got to get some sleep. You close your safes well after midnight, and you're sitting back at your desk at 6 in the morning, and that goes on holidays, weekends, around the clock, Christmas, on and a fly overseas, fly back. You don't have time to go home to change clothes. You're working so hard to keep all of the things going because it's happening in Angola but you're coordinating them all over the world. And I didn't want to stop until it was over because I didn't want to feel like I had seen up to here and I hadn't seen the end, the end of the show. And I was taking notes as I went. You're permitted to do that in the agency because you're having meetings, a staff meeting for example, from which may come 50 immediate cables, all of them vitally important. And you've got to be able to put down 7,000 rifles and not 700,000 rifles. So uh, a lot of people are scribbling notes, and I carefully scribbled notes, including as rapidly verbatim as I could as what Kissinger said, what Ambassador Ed Mulcahy said, what Jim Potts, Bill Colby said, what each person said. Uh, sometimes I couldn't keep up with them, but trying to get it all down because I had a purpose not to write a book. It never entered my mind. I had never known anyone who had written a book at that time but I just wanted to know for myself what this stuff was all about. Just to give you one anecdote, and again, you can read my book In Search of Enemies, so we don't have to spend more time on the Angola program, uh, except just to say that National Security Council meetings, and I didn't get to go to many of those. The CIA director would go to those. I went to all of the working group subcommittee meetings. Uh, but the National Security Council meetings are, are they're crackling they're important men, and I say men because I don't know of any women that have ever served on them. Uh, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, Vice President, the President comes in sometimes, a CIA director, people like that with enormous responsibilities and power who are aware of their power. The etiquette is that you don't keep people waiting. You don't show up 30 minutes late to those meetings because the other people are powerful and busy too. But one day, uh, uh, Henry Kissinger came to the meeting late and everyone was having to wait. Now mind you, this is not a meeting of the Supreme Court, which is pre prescribed by law where everybody sits according to seniority. Uh, it's, it's uh, at least that time it was an office, a not very esoteric office, 
in the White House with an oak table and some drapes and some maps, but no electronic flashing boards or anything like that, and people sit around a table, and then chairs where staffers can sit around uh, beside the table and help the boss. Uh, and, and the Secretary of Defense plopped down at a, at to, in a chair to talk to somebody while we waited for Kissinger, and then Kissinger came steaming in, and uh, he told the Secretary of Defense, you know, uh, I'm here, we can go to work, move down to your chair. And uh, the Secretary of Defense said, well, I'm all set up here today, you, you sit down there today. And Kissinger said, no, I'm the Secretary of State, this is my chair, you sit down there. And they argued like five-year-olds for about five minutes, and eventually the Secretary of Defense wouldn't move, and Kissinger had to go sit down at that end of the table, but he turned his back on the briefings and sulked. He wouldn't pay attention to that, to, to what we were saying that day, uh, because he couldn't have his chair. And we were making decisions that were getting people killed in Angola, and I'm not exaggerating one bit. I could go on and on with such anecdotes of what I saw. Some of them obviously much more pertinent and detailed and serious than that one, but the fact that I left afterwards, I testified for five days to the Congress, I did not plead the Fifth Amendment. I did not think that officers in the Marine Corps and middle-level le officers in the CIA should have the right to plead the Fifth Amendment. If they've been involved in a government operation, doing what they thought was their duty, if they've gone awry, I felt like we had a responsibility to take our medicine if, if punishment was due. In addition to which, because of the nature and detail of my notes, I knew there was no way they could put me in jail without putting Henry Kissinger in jail and the CIA director Bill Colby in jail too. So that would be my consolation if they convicted us of a conspiracy in the thing. And that's the beginning of the story because I left the agency then, I wrote the book, and then I went on to read endlessly and travel to countries like Grenada and Nicaragua and Cuba and Vietnam. Uh, target countries to try to learn for myself what this stuff was all about that I'd been part of. Yes, sir. Could you please comment on Barbara Honegger's uh, allegate, well substantiated allegations of treason uh, against Ronald Reagan and George Bush related to the CIA's murder of American military men in the October 1979 sabotage rescue mission in the Iranian desert in a bid to uh, in ensure Carter's defeat? Yeah, I certainly uh, shall. Yeah, uh, I sure do. Just just a second. I'm going to get to that, and that's a good question, but we have uh, a couple of details before. I should have done this before. The address of the bibliography, uh, so that you can order copies, and it may help you uh, get started reading for yourself. There's some students down at the University of Texas that helped me by mailing this thing out. And they have no financial support, so you have to send them. Uh, I think it's seven dollars is their cost for the printing costs and the envelopes and the mailing and whatnot. And uh, yeah, Bill? yeah, Bill yeah. yeah. And uh, also, we wanted to note that there's another uh, distinguished CIA alumnus who has gone public, Mr. Alan Orton. And uh, if you'd like to stand up as well, who's been active in in uh, and trying to speak out. Is there anyone else here, Alan, David, that I've missed? Yeah. Um, Lou, Wolf. Lou, are you still here? Yeah, Lou is the editor of the Covert Action Information Bulletin, which has probably done more to bring the history of the covert action of the secret activities of this government public uh, than any other one writer or author or publisher in the nation. And he's got copies back there, and I highly recommend his research and work, too. Now, excuse me, sir, getting back to your question, which is a good one. Where did you go? Uh, the October surprise. I, uh, 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 I, I, this is a difficult, this is an awkward question because I do not, I cannot endorse Barbara Honegger's research because I found it to be sloppy in some cases. Uh, so I'm not going to comment on it in detail. I will comment on the October surprise by saying that most of the best heads that I know analyzing that event, what the event is, is that in 1980, our embassy was being held hostage 
and our media was making a big issue out of it as part of the surge towards conservatism that eventually got Ronald Reagan and George Bush elected into the presidency. And this was a massive orchestrated plan uh, that involved the ABC television with America held hostage on television several times a day uh, to, make, to, to keep the people exercised uh, and feeling militant with people in the Pentagon and the CIA and the State Department cooperating with the Bush-Reagan candidates uh, to Jimmy Carter's uh, detriment. Uh, the point was that in October, if the hostages had been released, it's quite possible that Jimmy Carter would have won the election. So it was urgently important that Iran not release the hostages until after the elections, and they did not. And then they held them another 76 days until the inauguration of Ronald Reagan and released them two hours after he was sworn into office so he would get credit for their release. And within a few weeks, the first flow of arms was a approved sale of arms to Iran. Secret sale of arms was, in fact, approved. So uh, the best heads that I know believe uh, seem to agree that there was a tacit agreement, at least, between the Bush-Reagan campaign and the Iranian government that if they would keep the embassy people hostage that the, the U.S. administration, Reagan administration, would smile on them afterwards. Now, as far as the details of, of the, the story that George Bush flew to Paris to deliver $40 million to the Iranians as a payment for that sort of thing, in my own experience following this as closely as I can and talking to lots of journalists who have conscientiously researched this, I have not found that the case has been made to the point where I would have published it had I been a journalist or editor of the Washington Post. There are gaps. There's just details that are not there that would have been, been there, I think, if the story uh, were completely true. Moreover, one of the very astute people I know, Cy Hirsch, maybe one of the best uh, investigative journalists of our time, I would say one of the very best, certainly, maybe the best. Uh, he says, bullshit, the Iranians were quite smart enough to know in their own interests, they didn't have to be told by George Bush that it would work in their interests and favor to keep the embassy hostage and let Reagan get credit for their release. If they released the hostages after having antagonized and humiliated Carter, he would come after them with a vengeance. If they cooperated as they did uh, with Reagan by keeping the embassy people hostage and giving Reagan credit for getting them out, Reagan would tend to go soft on them, uh, which, which he did, and Khomeini could brag to his people that he had in fact impacted the American elections and virtually picked who our next president would be and ensured that it was his choice of Satan's in office, if you will. So perhaps that will suffice as a comment on that, and I again will not address Barbara Honegger's writing in detail. Yes, sir. Getting back to what you said about uh, Noriega maybe having the goods on Bush combined with other incidents like Station Chief Buckley being uh, having all that information extracted from him, and if indeed the presidency is being held hostage, or certainly we're we're experiencing a paralysis, yet denying degradation to the environment, like lemmings. Given also the dynamic with the East and their rapid changes, and it's becoming more of a north-south rather than east-west situation, so much of the CIA work is analyzing. Could you give us perhaps a, a look at the global situation, and as the spiral tightens, what's going on and what we can expect in the next in the Bush administration, for example? Well, wow, this, is, this is getting into the questions that you, that you love, in fact, because these, this, this gentleman has obviously uh, got his finger on the pulse of what's happening in the world and is studying it in a serious way. And a lot of lectures I give are to people who, who, who know where Washington is uh, and are interested in CIC stories. Uh, the, 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 Soviet, the Soviet Union, it, to me, we're in obviously the most uh, dangerous dynamic, exciting, troublesome period of change that I've seen since I was a kid at the end of World War uh, II. Uh, 
the Soviet leadership has recognized that the arms race has been a real bummer for the Soviet economy. They came out, they came out of World War II with a giant complex about having been invaded once again by European powers. And they said, never again, at any price. And, and with an enormous, at an enormous price of sacrifice uh, of, of consumer goods and comforts for the Soviet people, they created a superpower military. So you have a country there now which in some ways is a third world country, but with a superpower military and nuclear weapons and all of that. Now, the country is falling further and further behind not only Europe and the United States, but also the Pacific Rim countries. Singapore, Taiwan, for example, South Korea, not to mention Japan, passing the Soviet Union by in terms of, of effective, productive industrial countries. And to turn this around, they simply have to get out from under this gigantic burden of product producing arms uh, so that the people have enough of an interest. I mean, large portions of the Soviet Union don't have electricity. They don't have adequate housing. Uh, they don't have washing machines. They suffer privations that we would not enjoy. They spend a lot of time, instead of working in the factory, scurrying around at other jobs, just trying to have it a little better. Uh, and there's a, a, an entire industry that's defeating the purposes of the major industries. And the leadership eventually recognized this, and that's what Gorbachev is all about. The trouble is that the Soviet Union also, and, and Lord knows the, the moves they've made and the crow that they've eaten, they've admitted they lost the Cold War. They've, they've admitted that communism, well, in varying ways, that communism, they let Hungary say it's not a communist country. Things are happening in East Germany and Czechoslovakia that are utterly astonishing in terms of what you would have expected three or four years ago. Uh, and, and railing openly against themselves, against their own non-productivity, against what they have to do to turn their situation around. The trouble is that the Soviet Union has its full and fair share of Jesse Helms and Oliver North and people, and Pat Buchanan's, for heaven's sake, and people who, who, are, uh, uh, who, who, don't, who, who would stomp the world, uh, who want a military machine. And the word seems to be that if Gorbachev cannot show economic results in the relative near future, either he will be ousted by a conservative backlash, uh, or he will have to turn hard nose and crack down himself. It seems to be very much with, now the map is being reconstructed, whatever happens, but it seems to be very possible that in the next few years, and the Soviet economic problems are not problems that you can change in two years' time. 20 years, 50 years, yes. But I don't think Gorbachev can, can make the requisite changes in the time allotted and the clock's running on him. So we're going to see uh, major dramatic upheavals and changes and quite possibly a major crackdown. We've seen a major crackdown in China, for example, which was moving towards glasnost, and, and the people got a taste of it and clomp back to a repression like in the mid and late 50s. Uh, we could see this in the Soviet Union with a return to the Cold War. There are certainly plenty of people in the United States, including both intellectuals who analyze it that way, Sovietologists, but also people in the military industrial complex who would benefit enormously if it went that route, who are quite wishfully hoping it will, quite obviously wishfully uh, wishing that it will. And I can't predict uh, what's going to happen except I'm sitting here aware, keenly aware, reading the papers with a sense that we're living the most exciting and perhaps most dangerous period of history that I've witnessed in my 52 years. With our economy and our uh, perceived arrogance in light of all this, of our, you know, seemingly not wanting to face reality here, and as you so eloquently outlined, our real dangerous situation that we stand with just on an economic level alone. Can you look a little into that? It seems to me, and I consult with economists every chance I get, like Lloyd Dumas down in Texas and, and others uh, about just that. Where is it going for us? And, and mind you, all economists like Talmudic scholars that disagree, uh, it seems, uh, about whether, you know, slow decline of the United States or sudden collapse or what's going to happen. It seems to me that one possibility of what is going to evolve, it's clear that we have lost economic superpower status. We still are a gigantic.
capitalistic driving economic machine, but we're a debtor machine. Other countries are healthier than we are economically, they're creditor countries, specifically uh, Japan and Germany. Uh, other countries have industrial trade, uh, trade gaps, trade uh, 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 credits instead of deficits, uh, including Taiwan, for example, and Korea and Singapore, uh, to our disadvantage, uh, sucking the money away from us. But what they're doing so far is reinvesting the money back, buying up the debts in the United States. It has not turned into a bad debt yet. It's just that we own less and less uh, of ourselves, of our own country. So that we're creating a situation where there will be other peoples who will be the bankers and we will remain the policemen or the soldiers or, if you will, the mercenaries or describe it as you will. Uh, the way this could actually uh, work would be uh, we obviously would have tremendous clout, but we would have less control of economic decisions around the world. Just to give you some examples of how this works, George Bush, I don't know if you caught the 60 Minutes show during the presidential election campaign in which they revealed that 18 members of his campaign staff had accepted six-figure fees from other governments to advise them. He had surrounded himself with international lobbyists. What they're moving towards is an internationalist world, a multinational world. The, the people that he represents, which are the capitalists, are internationalists now. And they don't see the U.S. as an island in itself or their island or their country. They see a world economy of which they're a part and in control. And the U.S. building missiles and they can profit from that and the U.S. standard of living dropping, that's okay with them because their standard of living is certainly not dropping. And then watching, you know, events in, 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 uh, in Russia and China and other parts of the world to see how they can play and tune them to the increased productivity of their own economic interests. <laughs> One thing that Lloyd Dumas points out to me, though, that's pretty scary is I, I'm, I'm saying to him, but look, they spend all this money to build these weapons and then the weapons could destroy the world and they're not, it doesn't seem like they're thinking very far ahead in terms of their own interests. And he says, are you kidding? You know, these people are looking at quarterly reports and if they're in the red for two quarters, they're out. And uh, they're not planning the world economy. They're not planning the economic health of the United States. There's some vague trilateral planning between Europe, the U.S., and Japan of how they can work together to, to achieve uh, greater uh, industrial success. But basically, they're looking at very short-term profits of their corporations in competition with other corporations, and the, the, which is another way of saying uh, they're not responsible. They don't consider it their job to be responsible uh, for the fate of the Earth. That's other people's worries. Their job is to get that next quarterly report into the black and the shares up. Yes, sir. Hi. First, I'm uh, from the Christic Institute, and I speak for a lot of people there and thanking you for your work. There's great talk. Thank you. Um, also, I, I had a question about Southern Africa. Um, and with the conditions there, uh, talk of maybe perestroika in, in Southern Africa, in, in South Africa, I was wondering if you give that any credence, it seems hard for me to believe, and just to talk about what South Africa's role has been in destabilizing that whole region and how the CIA uses pariah nations like South Africa, Israel, Taiwan um, in, in, in its work. I don't know, I call people like Jerry Bender, who's the, the best scholar that I know on Southern Africa. Uh, I mentioned him, you know, during the talk, and, and in London I talked to Victoria Britton, uh, whose book, E Victoria, uh, certainly doesn't give you much hope about a change of whatever in, uh, in South Africa. She's detailing the continuing horrors, and they continue. Nevertheless, uh, they seem to be releasing some long-term prisoners, uh, political prisoners, and I read in the paper today that they seem to be making plans to release Mandela himself. And uh, it may be. Now, I know I visited South Africa many years ago, and I found that uh, uh, there, are, there are a lot of whites there who are not as comfortable with apartheid as you would think. There's a hardcore segment and enough of a majority that they've kept it tightly uh, buckled down, but I was invited 
and went to a sports event uh, at the University of Cape Town. I was a, a judo player. I was on a military cruise. I was, you know, goodwill sort of thing. I worked out, and uh, it was a totally multiracial uh, meeting and group, and the whites and blacks, we went drinking afterwards, and I was a little shocked. And they were saying that the, the whites that were in that group were saying how they didn't think apartheid was, was fair or right uh, at all. Uh, I don't know. Is it possible that they're getting tired? They, the, the, the Dutch descent hardcore uh, advocates of apartheid, are after the decades are feeling the international pressure and realizing that sooner or later they have to make change and trying to work out more peaceful accommodation. This is what they would have us believe. Uh, still a lot of violence going on. Still a lot of suffering going on. Uh, I have not been able to get any of my gurus on the subject to say that they are confident that apartheid is going to be abolished in the near future. But they give credit to the fact that Namibia is being, its status is being changed. The South Africans still want to retain control of it and the others in Mandela may be being released, and these do seem to be gestures tentative in the right direction. That's a kind of a tepid answer, but I just don't dare say anything much more forceful. Did you work at all with uh, South Africa folks when you were operating in Angola? Or? Yeah, I, I, now mind you, my job was in Washington, national security. I went to Angola, I had chiefs of station throughout Africa reporting uh, to me and to my boss. Uh, and we were working with South Africans, and I definitely had personal contact with South Africans and all of that. Uh, so the answer is definitely yes. Uh, the CIA, I can go on to comment beyond your question, had a traditional uh, affinity for the white South Africans. Boss was considered to be a friendly service. When I first joined the CIA, uh, I uh, found the deputy chief of the Africa Division was waiting for his retirement job, which he had selected for himself to be Pretoria, because it was considered to be the prize of all jobs. Because the climate is wonderful, it is a beloved country, uh, or could be, and your job was uh, the CIA did not run any operations there because that might offend boss, and uh, so you got to play tennis and chess and go to the cocktail party and be in the circuit with the elite of the white South African society. So it was a prize assignment. Uh, years later, I find uh, John <coughs> Kelly researching with, uh, I think it was CBS television, breaking the story that it was the CIA that originally fingered Nelson Mandela to boss for his arrest uh, uh, 20 years ago, whatever it was. Uh, years ago now, so there's been a very intimate relationship between the two. When the sanctions were forced upon the Reagan administration, they had an exception that the CIA would not be prohibited from continuing its intimate relationship with the white South African Secret Service. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I was, uh, first I noted uh, that you, did, you seemed uh, not to mention too much about Afghanistan, which as you mentioned was is uh, the largest covert operation arguably since World War II. Um, I wondered, uh, at the risk of being a bit specific, sorry, Lord? Uh, at the risk of being a bit specific, I wondered if you might uh, uh, comment on uh, what many believe uh, the, uh, the covert operation, CIA covert operation in Afghanistan is run by only a handful of men. And how is it that the CIA, if you believe that, uh, if you're familiar with it, and whether or not, uh, how could that come about that the CIA would let that happen or, or was it a policy, or did it just come about like that, or could you comment on that? Uh, you're saying that it was run by a handful of CIA men? Well, that it still is, but that it, it was much smaller, a much smaller group of men than, uh, than typically um, most people that for such a large operation should have been in charge for, for such a large operation. Well, this, this operation, we get glimmers and glimpses of the budget now and then, hundreds of millions of dollars, and we get a sense of its size, which would make it, I mean, at times when uh, the uh, Contra program was getting $19 million and then $100 million increments, they were getting hundreds of millions of dollars. So it seemed to be a much larger operation. 
It was never controversial. The administration uh, never chose to make it a controversial issue, which they chose to make the Contra program a uh, public issue. They wanted to, apparently because they wanted to condition the nation to an eventual uh, invasion of Nicaragua. Uh, they did not want to have a public debate about Afghanistan, and it was not a, sit a situation where uh, they were as vulnerable because there was a Soviet army there. So it was harder for people in this country to marshal a protest of the CIA going in to help the Afghani people. Now, in fact, there was a lot of cynicism in it that could have been brought out. The Soviet invasion, in fact, was provoked by the CIA trying to engineer a coup d'etat that would have created a government on the Soviet flank that would have been loyal to the, to the CIA, as Iran had been under the Shah, more or less. And the Soviets, not willing to let that happen, put in their troops. So there's that kind of complexity behind the scenes. And then this massive flow of arms and relatively little information about the details of how it was run. I have not commented on it in great length because it was not an area of operations where I ever served when I was with the government, nor is it an area that I visited since I left the government, nor has there been a great mass of information available about it, uh, and, and therefore, rather than speculate, I've just mentioned it in passing. If they did manage to manage it with fewer people, it would mean that they were setting up pipelines, fewer CI staff people, they were setting up pipelines to funnel the money and the arms to the, the forces that they were supporting in Afghanistan. And uh, this might uh, or might not be a factor in more of that being used to, to, uh, to, to smuggle drugs to other enterprises and stinger missiles getting lost and floating around the terrorist community. Uh, so we're faced now, there are what, 50 odd stinger missiles that are missing now that are not accounted for that might appear in, in uh, Ireland, for example, uh, or somewhere else. And, and uh, the, the people who worry about terrorism are sweating that uh, uh, with good, good reason. Yes? I was really interested to hear you explain how the destruction of the environment figured into everything else you were talking about. Yes. Uh, the destruction of the environment, of course, is, is uh, in some ways there's only the parallel of just the indifference to the fate of the earth. The same mentality that would produce 60,000 thermonuclear weapons and bluff and play with them is the same mentality that's saying we're not going to be here very long anyway. It's the James Watt syndrome saying uh, the fate of the earth, the end of the earth is in sight. God put these things on earth for us to use them, so we might as well chop down the trees, you know, and, and D-Day will come when the last tree is felled, when the earth ends anyway. This kind of, of short-sighted thinking, uh, uh, the presumption, the Jerry Falwell, you know, God will call the chosen up on high and, and uh, a wishing, you know, begging, please call us kind of thinking, as opposed to seeing ourselves as custodians uh, of the planet Earth. It's taken, as Carl Sagan points out, four billion torturous years to evolve to the point where we are today. We, whatever we are, uh, are we going to pass on something for, you know, that will be here another billion years? Or will it be here another 25 years? And our attitudes are 25 years. We're doing things now that if we move to correct in terms of the greenhouse effect in terms of the of the the toxic wastes. I mean, they're running studies now. Carl Sagan has sent me some material on this from papers that he's delivered, and, and uh, because I'm I'm finishing up a book on the subject of the, of the arms race, uh, showing how they're spending X billions of dollars to study how these toxic materials could be stored safely for 10,000 years because that's the maximum amount of time that they can possibly estimate the, the, the state of the crust of the world's, you know, they can't plan beyond that. But the stuff will be toxic 50,000 or more uh, years. And so, you know, we're not planning that far down the road. But getting more specific beyond just the arrogance, you get into the weapons plans. 
where managers of the plants have some, some radioactive gases or liquids that they need to get rid of. Uh, and if they go to the Congress and say, we have this problem, we need $10 billion to find a way to, to store these things, it becomes a big, stinky political issue. So they just quietly open the vents and let them blow out into the atmosphere and, and dump them into, you know, uh, in Pentex, and this, by the way, the media got onto this finally. We've had it in the peace community for decades. Uh, the best book I can think of on the subject is uh, Wasserman and Solomon's book, Killing Our Own, uh, which is an excellent book summarizing this, this kind of, and details of this kind of activity. But uh, at the Pentex plant in uh, near Amarillo, Texas, they had these hot radioactive liquids the, and, and again, they didn't want to go to Congress and ask for money, so they dug what we call tanks in the ground. That's the farmers dig tanks with bulldozers and to collect rainwater for the cattle to drink. They scraped out these flat tanks in the ground and poured the, the stuff in there without sealing it. Not, I mean, with rubber or concrete or anything. Uh, they just poured the stuff in there so it could percolate down into the Oglala Aquifer or blow, the winds are quite strong, blow into neighboring fields or evaporate up into the air. And that was uh, their donation to the environment, just to save money and embarrassment. Now, there is a move afoot to investigate these things and to, and to talk about cleaning it up and to talk about criminal charges for the, the, the directors of some of these plants. Uh, so, you know, we are making dents on some of this. These thousands of books that are out now, the 120 books on my list are almost all written in the 80s. I should have gone on one more minute in my talk to point out that your effort, some of you, I was, I was on the other side, stopped the Vietnam War eventually. Two million people had been killed, but if you hadn't risen up and taken to the streets and made them get out, four million people would have been killed. And I will flatly assert that we stopped and blocked the invasion of Central America during the 80s. We, all of us, myself, Lou Wolf, David Allen, all of us, a lot of you, we, the, the, the Reagan administration had clearly committed itself to orchestrating this nation into a war, and they'd picked Nicaragua. And they were blocked by the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the Secretary of Defense, Caspar Weinberger, in open debates. Uh, he was saying, not with my Defense Department until you can sell it to the American people so they will applaud the troops coming home. No more Vietnams. No more unpopular wars. We will not do it unless you can sell it in advance to the people. And we kept the, the uh, vigilance of the people up to 66 to 70 percent against the military invention, intervention, so that Weinberger himself was saying, no, not, and Gorman and Galvin down in the South Command and the Joint Chiefs are saying, no way until the people buy it. If you can get the percentages down to 55 percent in favor of it, we'll think about it. So. We can make a difference, and we are make a, making a difference in terms of the uh, accountability of plant uh, directors, for example, in the munitions and arms plants. Not enough, not fast enough. The problem is much greater. But at the same time, you know, we do have them talking. We did get an INF treaty. We did stop the Central American War. Uh, you know, you grab at straws of hope because you need hope in order to keep your energies up. Yes, sir. Keep hope alive. Uh, two brief things. One to the remaining audience, uh, a, a shameless plug, Common Concerns Bookstore, DuPont Circle on Connecticut Avenue carries many, if not all, of the books that Mr. Stockwell is describing. Uh, question addressed to you, a bit um, personal, just what, uh, if you could briefly outline or describe anything that your detractors has to say about you and your, uh, your goals that has a shred of credibility. In other words, uh, play the devil's advocate with yourself for just a moment. Is there anything that you personally find on target that's like anti uh, Questions message? that I have trouble handling. They don't have a question they can present in the lectures that, uh, that we don't have the answers to. We have staked out the intellectual high ground some of the fiercest battles that I've been in since I've been out uh, have been uh, Lillipu Lilliputians, Gulliver's, Gulliver's Travels arguments about which end of the egg uh, in terms of how we should go about our struggle. 
arguing about details of accuracy uh, with Barbara Honecker and others, uh, in which my position, and I think Lou's I know, and David's and the others, are that uh, he, he was the director of research for a while with Christic, that we have the strongest one single thing we have is, is the, high, the intellectual high ground. And we just simply cannot compromise, we cannot bullshit, we cannot be loose, we can't say the end justifies the means, therefore go ahead and say it because it has a nice ring to it, uh, because the basic of, uh, basis of our case is hard, solid facts. And, uh, and for that reason, uh, I, I sometimes, uh, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm always a little turned on in lectures when some, like last night in Brockport, New York, a guy stood up and said, Mr. Stockwell, I want you to tell us about all of these fictional novels you guys are writing and making fortunes on. And I said, excuse me, before you finish your question, what is a fictional novel? And, uh, and then he said, come on, don't give me any shit. I know you went into this to make a lot of money and you're ripping off everybody and everything. And, and I went on to point out, I said, sir, you have me confused with Oliver North. <laughs> you know, my lecture fees at best run 10% a, a a to 5% to of his. He's made millions of dollars by lying by destroying, he did a lot more damage to Ronald Reagan than I ever did, by running operations that killed people in Central America by collaborating with drug smugglers, and he just got his pension restored, and I have no pension. I had a guy nail me on a talk show uh, in, uh, in Denver, radio talk show, and he said, uh, he said, what's your retirement check? How can you... How do you dare accept your retirement checks while you attack the government the way you're doing? And I said, who retired? I quit. And he said, come on now, you retired. No, I quit. I was 40 years old. I was not eligible for retirement. I quit. Uh, I got nothing to, you know, to feed my family except my wit and a little bit of luck and the generosity of people who bring me into lecture. And when I can sell something that I write, but mostly the New York publishers don't want to publish the stuff I want to write, because most of them are owned by the multinational corporation. I appreciate your presence of mind. Well, I just, I, I came into this, mind you, uh, uh, with, with a morbid fear of public speaking, uh, with, with, with the thought that I was the least likely public speaker on, on the face of the earth, having been slow of wit, and having had a little bit of a speech, uh, not impediment, but a speech difficulty as a boy, uh, you wouldn't pick me if you were going to train someone and send them out to debate these issues. And I gained confidence over the years because I found that the subject material genuinely interested people and that as I read the books, I could handle the questions. Uh, I have fought off and on with the stomach ulcer and the anxiety and and loose bowels before I go on to lecture and what if they ask this and that and the other and and there were a lot of humiliations at first where I would be making a point and someone would stand up and say with all due credit Mr. Stockwell at one point I had the, the pyramids I'd misplaced them by 2500 years uh, and mind you I've been to Egypt and seen the pyramids you know and uh, the result is because of my anxieties uh, you just don't catch me very often. My nose is not in a book. And uh, trying to memorize, trying to make the gray matter work, studying. Before I came here tonight, I was in the hotel going over my notes. Mind you, I've given 600 lectures, but I was going over my notes again to get it straight. But it's given me a lot of confidence to find professors and scholars, to have Carl Sagan say, you got it right, John. You know, then, you know this sort of thing, we do have it right. And the reason I make, I lean on this point a little bit is that if I can get to a point of intellectual confidence, you can too. And, and this is very important because I know what the feeling is when you go out and you're on a protest or a demonstration or you go home on the holidays and your parents are nice people but they're saying, what is this liberal shit you're being fed at college? I should shut off your, you know, your, your money or something. Uh, you can develop the same confidence just by informing yourself and getting your head involved. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Stockwell, I 
Yes, I'd like to bring back the issue of Nicaragua and uh, get your response to the uh, interference in Nicaragua's election, the massive infusion of money, and the destabilization of that election. And also, I'd like to get your response, what do you think the scenario would be if the Sandinistas win the next election? Well, uh, a, a well-run election manipulation operation you won't see too much of. They, the CIA will be there quietly giving money to, the, uh, to, to its choice candidates, and the candidates will be spending the money and building the cadres, and of course it taints th their cause to have the CIA up front. So generally the CIA will not come to the rallies and go to the big meetings. They'll have quiet meetings in the CIA officer's home, and the Violeta Chamorros will walk out with $5 million in cash to distribute and disperse, and the CIA will put in radio stations around the region, of which there are 70 that can beam shows into the targeted country, namely Nicaragua, full of the propaganda. But still, it has to be orchestrated quietly uh, for it to be maximum effectiveness. This is one of the Sandinistas' biggest points now, strengths, is that uh, Chamorro is, is just very openly identified as the CIA candidate there. Uh, there have been elections won by the CIA candidate in 1980. Uh, CIAGA is the way it's spelled, I believe, in Jamaica, won the election despite open support from the CIA. So Chamorro might win if, if, if the country were, sta were stressed out enough and the people were so tired and the Sandinistas with their policies had turned sour and turned the people off. I don't think she will. I don't think she'll come close. But if it's done well, we may not see. We do have historical evidence, though, to see how these things are done. Uh, in 1984, in El Salvador, uh, the CIA spent $2.2 million on those elections successfully to put Napoleon Duarte, a longtime CIA agent, uh, into power. He was selected because he was a moderate who could be sold to the people in this country as a moderate so the support could continue to El Salvador. The reason we know so much about that election is because uh, this antagonized Jesse Helms, who favored Roberto Dobuisson, you know, uh, Nazi uh, comrades in arms. And so he went public from his position on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He got himself brief of the truth of what the CIA had done, and he held a press conference and told us in great rage about how much money, how it had been spent, some of the things I recall, they hired organized teams of journalists from uh, Europe and around and flew them on blue chip tours of El Salvador, guiding them through, taking nice care of them, and paying them off handsomely to go back and write articles that would create international sympathy for Duarte's campaign. They're obviously doing the same thing with, with Chamorro. Uh, in this, uh, this get-together in Costa Rica. She was clearly presented in the most favorable light uh, by not just Bush, but Arias and all the others. And uh, so that's a little evidence right there of the ploy and what they're doing. Now, uh, he, went in, he went public very shortly after the elections, which I believe were in April of 84, were they not? In El Salvador, you can go through and flip through the microfilms and find his statements about that. He was quite enraged, and I used it against him in my lecture. I pointed out that he says I'm a traitor when I reveal stuff, but he was revealing sensitive briefings. But he has Washington sufficiently terrorized that no one castigated him for revealing that secret information. Uh, All these four footnotes. And Washington's War on Nicaragua, Holly Sklar's book, yes. Uh, by the way, which is an excellent book, again, for a case study of a covert action and a case study of that one in particular. Now, presuming that the Sandinistas win, uh, we can look forward for continued pressure from Bush, continued contra-activity, continued economic embargo, economic destabilization, and at worst, from Bush's interests, another run on the, on, the president's, on the presidential election the next time around. If nothing else, if it uh, works to get uh, the Sandinistas out, then the next time elections come up, 
they will have that much more water under the bridge, that much more suffering by the Nicaraguan people, and Violeta Chamorro presumably having that many more years to campaign. I still think that there is a possibility uh, that Nicaragua would be the location of our next uh, uh, war. Uh, we don't know yet where Bush is going to go. So far, he seems to be ac exercising more restraint than Ronald Reagan did. Reagan clearly liked to stomp. Bush has pulled back a little bit when he could have stomped in Panama. This may be because he intends to maintain throughout his eight years uh, more restraint because he believes that he and the people he represents, they're picking our pockets. The money is being transferred from the poor and the middle classes uh, to the capitalists at a tremendous rate in the last eight years and right now, if they exercise the people with something unpopular like a war, uh, then we may rise up and force them to go back, you know, we may wake up. Uh, and, and he may in fact see his role as to keep the lid on and not provoke the people throughout. However, if the economic situation in the U.S. worsens and the deficit thing comes to a head and the problems become much more intense and the people start grumbling loudly traditionally they crank out a war to distract the people and he does have uh, um, uh, uh, an obvious case of testosterone poisoning and he it would not be hard to see him taking some pleasure in orchestrating a war and showing that he has bought pardon me that he has courage too <laughs> This is exactly what I'm trying to say is that it may be that his policies generally are to keep it cool throughout, but it may also that he be that he's posturing so that he will be forced into a war and that this is the way that they are trying to orchestrate the frustration in the American people so when he finally puts the U.S. troops into Panama, people will applaud and demonstrate in the streets. And if that's his plan, then you could look for it to happen perhaps in the, the, before the next election process if there's a serious challenge to him. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Stockwell. Uh, two quick questions. First of all, any facts emerging about the death of Zia al haq in Pakistan? And second question, uh, the FBI has had a long history of intimidating people like you. Think of poor Carl Robeson and the recent biography uh, written about him and his trials and tribulations. Uh, so my second question is, uh, is this sort of in campaign of intimidation of American citizens going on today? Uh, I'll pass on the first question because I just simply don't have any inside information on Pakistan. I'm not saying this is not an important part of the world. It is. It's just not my area of expertise. Uh, on the FBI intimidation, as I said before, we have the FBI directors, admissions of punishment of FBI officers for improper uh, uh, targeting of, of civic groups, of peace groups. Uh, we have uh, evidence of disruptions. We don't know what the CIA has been doing. Uh, I have been uh, sued. I've been, uh, uh, there's, there's clearly uh, universities that won't hire me to lecture because the Defense Department or the FBI is telling them I'm a dirty bird. Uh, it goes a step beyond that and something, I'm not sure whether it's funny or scary, but last week I was on CNN Crossfire uh, they asked me on the show, and this is where Pat Buchanan and Mike Kingsley get together and beat up on guests and yell at each other. It's not my choice of format. It's not a format where I would see myself as being quick-witted to really do a good job on. Uh, and then worse, after they'd gotten me hooked onto it, and I thought they were going to come up with someone like Bill Colby to debate me on the subject of should we assassinate people, which is what... William Webster, the CIA director, and the White House are trying to sell to the Congress right now as a greater license to kill, and we were to discuss this issue, and it's important, and I have a strong feeling about it, so I agreed to go. Then they told me that they had gotten Gordon Liddy uh, to appear against me, 
And of course, as you all know, Gordon Liddy is a Looney Tune. And uh, sure enough, this thing, and everybody's yelling and shouting at each other. And in the course of the show, uh, he threatened my life. He said I should be killed. And uh, I protested, and then in different words, he said it again. And uh, so I, I demanded uh, that I be given a moment to speak. And I said, I want everybody uh, in the nation that's listening to this show to remember if my cars run off the road someday, to remember Mr. Liddy's threat and his FBI and CIA buddies. And uh, I wasn't kidding at all. Uh, I was not amused with all the loonies that there are in the world out there, uh, some of them drawing FBI salaries uh, to have Liddy going on television saying he thought I would be off. As far as uh, morally winning the debate, uh, it was a walkover uh, because he was so outrageous. Uh, I, I, I think that 98% of the people in the nation would say that he and Buchanan did, uh, discredited themselves totally. By the way, if you can get a copy of this thing, my, my slow wit, there's, a, there's an amusing little footnote in it. I was in Dallas and I couldn't hear because everybody was yelling so much and the acoustics were bad on my little ear thing. But Buchanan wanted to stick it to me and uh, he, he, he said that, uh, he said, if you have a terrorist like this man, Amak Gibral, he said, as I heard it, uh, who's clearly killing people, and, and, and we had a chance to get him, should we not go in and kill him? And my answer is, well, if you're going to do it fairly, uh, you would also go after Luis Posada Carillas and his friend George Bush, would you not? And uh, his eyes went kind of crossed. And uh, now, where my wit was too slow to really nail him is, I, don't, I can't think of, maybe David can, I can't think of any renowned terrorist named Amak Gibral, but there was an Amak Halil, uh, who was the assassin in La Penca. And I would love to have been quick enough thinking to say, did you mean a Mak Halil, the CIA assassin in La Penca who blew up Eden Pastora and Martha Honey and Tony Abergan? And should we kill him? You know, it, I, had, I had an opening and I missed it. I don't know. But I still made the point pretty good. His eyes crossed and he backed away from the question. Yes, sir. What governmental mechanisms would you recommend to bring the National Security Council and the Central Intelligence Agency under the system of checks and balances that would hopefully prevent some of these atrocities that you've enlightened us about tonight? Well, this is a tough, tough, basic problem that was debated bitterly after World War II when the OSS had a mystique and they were discussing whether or not we should have a CIA or a Central Intelligence. And in fact, the OSS, I've been working on a book that I've started writing on that begins back in those days, fiction, and it's quite uh, not surprising at all when I think about it, but by the end of the war, the OSS had become deeply involved in corruption, international smuggling. Uh, in, in Germany, right after the war, the equivalent of uh, two and a half billion dollars in gold and jewelry from the Reichsbank disappeared. And the intelligence officers were involved like sharks in getting bites and bits and pieces of that. And there were studies done on this, and Truman uh, at first had deep reservations about keeping a secret branch of the government going at all because of the corruption. And then he got into the Cold War and got gung-ho and re was pushing them. And then later in retirement, he again regretted essentially uh, what he had done. The problem, very simply, is how do you have a controlled little bit of cancer in a free society? Can you trust people with secrecy and the license to run deadly operations? And how are you going to control them? In J. Edgar Hoover's case, he turned the energies of the FBI into building files on congressmen and senators so he could blackmail them, so he could keep them from doing uh, their duty to the public and people of this country. I would say that's a pretty clear lesson learned. And the CIA's involvement in our politics goes back to, to the, the, the Dewey Truman uh, election campaign when, when, uh, when the CIA was using secret funds trying to get Dewey in and Truman out. 
and then you get the assassination of President Kennedy. And again, go and read those books for yourself. Uh, that's massive involvement in our, our uh, in, in democracy, if you will. And uh, my sense is very clear of this. It was not when I first left the agency, but the more I read and the more I study it, the more I say that uh, I used to say we should take our chances on facing the world without a secret, a deadly arm. Now I say flat out we'll be safer and healthier and stronger if we close down the operation sides of the CIA and keep the National Security Council as a strict advisory office only without any secret police like the CIA to go out and run operations for them. We need good intelligence, but we don't get it from the CIA machine. I think the people standing at the mics now, that's going to be all the questions we can take. Yes, I don't think very impressed you uh, outlast more of your listeners. Uh, my question has to, you seem to agree with most an analysts that the next Vietnam will probably come in Nicaragua. Uh, I personally think that it's more likely to come in El Salvador or even in uh, Honduras, going to war to protect one of our erstwhile allies. And I'm interested if you know of any current covert operations there helping our allies in the wars that are going on in El Salvador and in Honduras, uh, leading us to the second Vietnam in those countries, and perhaps in comparison with how covert ops operated to help us get involved in the first Vietnam. Well, you notice throughout the evening I've referred to the Central American War and not the Nicaraguan War because I have presumed all along, and we, uh, various people agreeing and disagreeing vigorously, but uh, scholars and studiers of these things over the 80s about the likelihood of a Central American war and where and how it would happen, uh, we, I, I think we've all pretty well presumed that it would encompass El Salvador and uh, it would be run from the the USS Honduras would be the, the, the immobile uh, air carrier from which we would fly the missions. And Nicaragua was being groomed as the clear trigger and target. El Salvador was definitely a candidate to trigger the intervention of the U.S. military. And had they uh, had an insurrection uh, uh, run amok or, or, or ignited an insurrection as opposed to what's happening now, uh, they might have gone into El Salvador, but undoubtedly I felt they would move. And again, I don't mean to be egocentric, better minds than mine I'm talking to, and this is what we're concluding, sort of. There's a saying we used to have in the agency that you, can, you can't buy uh, countries of the third world, but you can rent them. And uh, you quit making payments and, and you, know, you may lose your position there. Uh, but we've bought a pretty good investment in the 12 bases in Honduras. And uh, uh, I, I, I've never seen a situation developing where we would be at war with Honduras. Right, yeah. with the movements in Honduras yeah. or El Salvador, or even Guatemala, where the revolutionary movements continue to grow. That's, and we would go in to help our erstwhile allies, the governments. I could easily see a situation develop where we were going in, landing and staging through Honduras uh, into fighting in El Salvador and Nicaragua and Panama. And we would be staging from Panama as well. And do you have any knowledge of current covert operations in, say, Honduras or Guatemala or El Salvador, which would, uh, again, lead us step by step into uh, actual military involvement there? Well. Uh, speculate. So. Well, but uh, but but that would be a lengthy speculation. Reviewing sort of the the that re read Holly Sklar's book. I mean, we would have to review you know the activities and there's lots of things going on and orchestrations of violence and U.S. Uh, pilots shooting up uh, Salvadorian villages and provocations all over the place. Let me clarify one thing, unless I am misquoted after tonight. I am not saying that I think we're on the brink of a Central American war. 
I think the odds are very remote right now that it's going to happen. It could happen. Uh, it could be that Panama would be the trigger. It could be that Nicaragua would be the trigger maybe a year or two from now. But I'm not saying that I think it's going to happen. Thank you. On your comments that the best election manipulation is the ones that we don't see. And bring us back to Southern Africa, Angola, South Africa, and Namibia as we approach next week's elections. From where you were in 1976, with the, how is the Angola project preparing for the 1978 planned Namibian elections? And were some of those highlights including the kind of tactics that we have seen in 1988 and 89, namely the massacre of Swapo people inside Namibia in early April, uh, using UNITA forces to help with the DTA US-backed party this summer during the registration period, and this week's forgery of United Nations Transitional Assistance Group documents. Uh, in 1976, mind you, I was leaving the government preparing to write my book. My assessment of the chances of elections actually happening in Namibia at that time was that there was no chance. And uh, I took that talk as being just simply not serious talk. I barely remember it. Uh, it, it has turned out now that the South Africans have yielded uh, and they're trying to do, obviously, I think, what we did in Nicaragua when we yielded and pulled out the Marines in 33 and leave behind a defense force that will give them good solid control behind a front like the, the El Salvadorian democracy or the Honduran democracy or the Guatemalan democracy. Uh, they'll, they'll have control, tight control of the country without taking all the international heat. Uh, yes, Mr. Stockwell. I've heard your discussions in the past on public radio about uh, CIA and government uh, orchestrations of experiments on the population with uh, viruses and other sorts of, like whooping cough and the epidemics in San Francisco Bay, etc. I'm just curious about your knowledge or your speculation of CIA and government involvement in the AIDS epidemic. Yeah, this, this is one that frustrates me greatly. Uh, I debated Admiral Turner at Colby College about a year ago, and during my presentation, we didn't exactly, he wouldn't debate me, but I presented and he presented, and then they voted on the CI on campus. And in my presentation, I said that we had the MK Ultra program with the irresponsible research on diseases, and afterwards, mysterious diseases appeared rampant in our country. I did not say that I believed that, that AIDS was the direct product of uh, the government experiments, uh, but I was suggesting that we have certainly the right, in fact the obligation, to investigate. We know they were experimenting massively and pseudoscientists, I call them, promiscuously with diseases on population groups. Uh, jerks running around taking sloppy notes about what was happening uh, and calling that experimentation. Like, like uh, John Le Carre's The Looking Glass War, doing it because they had a charter to do it rather than because they were real scientists really trying to find out what would happen. Uh, it would seem to me if you have a disease like AIDS up here, which is mysterious and unexplained, and you know that the government was experimenting carelessly, that we ought to have a vigorous, open investigation of what they did. We might find the clue to AIDS in there. My guess is that if there was such experimentation that did lead to AIDS, those files probably have been burned very quickly uh, in the early 80s. But nevertheless, in that debate, I just mentioned the experimentation and the mysterious diseases and I went back to the University of Maine a couple of nights ago, and two friendly supporters, the guy driving me from the airport and the professor who hosted me, said, uh, by the way, I heard you, you, know, you did real well at Colby, but you really stepped in it on the subject of AIDS. And I said, you know, what are you talking about? And they said, well, we heard you really lost the audience when you made these wild allegations about AIDS. And all I had said was just what I would said to you here. 
So this is one of these cases where they have staked out a version of the high ground so that if you even talk about the possibility of AIDS having derived from irresponsible government experimentation, you lose your audience. That's apparently what they were saying happened at Colby College there. Uh, let me clarify my position. As I said to those two gentlemen, I don't back down an inch on that. Uh, we, we have the government experimenting with diseases, with viruses. We know that some of those viruses, like swine fever, resemble AIDS. Uh, I've even been known to crack jokes at lectures saying we haven't closed the link to see how the virus could get from human beings to swine, waiting for someone to say, well, they're pig fuckers, aren't they? You know, but uh, we, you know, we, they're experimenting with viruses that resemble AIDS and we have AIDS appear. Uh, I demand, let me just say, I demand that we investigate fully and see if there is any linkage. And if there is, that we hold them accountable for it. And two, that we might find the key to how to solve it. By the way, until today, some of the best, uh, I, I stay involved, I correspond with some, some lively, progressive, open-minded, responsible, responsible doctors, which means they're still members of the AMA about the AIDS issue. And we argue a little bit, even though I'm not a scientist and I'm way over my head. But anyway, the best uh, summary uh, that I found today of what AIDS may be all about is the Covert Action Information Bulletin's articles, Lou's work, in 1987, they had to break it into two issues, one in September and one in uh, December. And in that, the scientists that they had write about AIDS then, they do not present conclusions. They offer, as I recall, six possible scenarios from which AIDS may have derived. There is also an excellent book written by Jad Adams called AIDS, the HIV uh, Myth. I think I've got that backwards. Uh, by St. Martin's Press this spring, where he raises a lot of questions. What he's really pointing out is that they don't even know that AIDS is caused by the HIV virus. It could be a passenger virus piggybacking on the same cause. They don't know anything about AIDS yet except some of its symptoms and some of its behavior patterns. Now, the, the health establishment seized upon it uh, as uh, an excuse to grab a billion and a half dollars of research money uh, and got a big machine going again. AIDS remains something like the 15th killer in the United States today, a hideous, horrible disease. But since, if I've got my figures correct at this late hour, uh, since it was discovered in 81, there have been 59,000 people die of AIDS. And that's a lot, and it's a terrible disease, but there's going to be 850,000 die this year alone of cardiovascular disease relating to eating beef and fats and smoking. Now, just to give you a sense of the relative proportion, and there's more research being done on AIDS and money being spent on it uh, than there is, and propaganda uh, being spent on it to the discomfiture of the, the principal groups, which are the, the needle, needle drug users and, and the homosexuals. Uh, than, than is being spent on how beef fats and Jesse Helms' tobacco uh, kills uh, whatever that figure is, more people, exponentially, algebraically more people. It's about time for me to bring this to a, and get to, uh, get to a glass of beer. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Mr. Stockwell. Um, these pres public presentations that you give must be very upsetting for the CIA. Why aren't they doing more to stop you? Well, we haven't come to that point in this society where they can afford to gun down people who are speaking out without having a backlash that could shut them down. Uh, they're more paranoid of their survival than you might think. During the Watergate hearings, I remember well, this is before transistors, uh, but everybody in the agency, just about every office had a portable TV plugged in watching the hearings because we were so mortified and terrified because here some guys were being on trial. A president was thrown out of office. Eighteen members of his staff went to jail, including the attorney general, for a little breaking and entering operation and covering it up. I mean, you know, you're supposed to do three of those before breakfast every morning. I mean, we, we presumed 
always that running these operations that we work for the presidency and that if you got caught, uh, you would be quickly sent out on assignment to Ouagadougou for two years until the dust settled. Uh, or uh, the attorney general and people would step in and you know memos would be written and, and you'd be let off the hook. And to realize that those two postal clerks, I mean those two GS9s who had been opening the mail uh, were prosecuted. Now their superiors were not and they should have been. But for, I remember when it re I realized with a shock, the CIA had this a whole wing of attorneys paid by the taxpayer, but they could not represent these people in a criminal trial. The law would not permit it. So these two GS9s were out there trying to raise money for their own defense, and the CIA had to cut them off. And then the, 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 in the Watergate thing, all the chiefs were saying, I don't know those people, you know. I, I vaguely remember they worked in the office. I may have met them at a cocktail party sometime. You're on your own, Charlie, you know. This is, of course, at the heart of what Gar Gordon Liddy says, is if you work for someone, you should be willing to go to jail forever to protect them. Anyway, in the agency, we were a lot more paranoid about our vulnerability, about our being exposed, about remembering to burn files, about the fact that we could be closed down and prosecuted than people out in the community realize. And they're smart enough to know that if they start stomping those of us, and there are a bunch of us speaking out, that public opinion would turn against them. Now, in my own case, I, I'm quite ambivalent about this because when, I, you know, when the lights are on and I'm feeling good and I'm awake, I note that I'm a blue-eyed wasp from the middle of the establishment, and I went public in the prescribed fashion in the States testifying to the Congress, going on 60 Minutes, writing a book. I did not reveal names or codes, uh, so I'm not, I haven't made myself really very vulnerable, and I did not, partially because I just didn't have the opportunity, I did not reveal the kind of information that would put an Ed Wilson, or a Frank Sturgis, or a Theodore Shackley, or, or Carlos Marcello in jail. And because witnesses around those people uh, uh, died. I don't know any witnesses around Shackley who died, but around Marcello and Wilson, witnesses died. And I was addressing the system. I just hadn't been involved in the kind of operations that would put the really heavy people in jail. Uh, I say that, and, and then at the same time, I wake up at 4 o'clock most mornings saying, what the fuck have I gotten myself into, you know? And I've got a little boy, and Gordon Liddy's threatening me on national television, and uh, I, I have not intelligently directed the course of my life. And so I do suffer some anxiety, and then when I'm clear-headed and calm, I say, nah. The thing that's worried me the most was not that they would run an operation to kill me approved by the director, uh, because it's too, much, too likely of that, me or my colleague Phil Agee or David or the others who lose speaking out, there's too much chance that people would, uh, someone in the group would blow the whistle and they would go to jail for violating our civil rights. I mean, it, it's too explosive considering the damage that we're doing. Uh, but the Looney Tunes, uh, the people on the fringes, Yolando Bosch's and Felix Rodriguez's and people like that, uh, uh, are, are scarier. They're, they're the ones, are, are the Luis Posada Carillas, uh, these people, uh, yeah, that's a different thing. And uh, they, they're, they're at a level where they might get a phone call by someone saying, boy, that's a son of a bitch, you know. I don't know why he's allowed to go around speaking out. And so they drive by and crank it through few 357 rounds at you. Uh, I, 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 uh, I, I think I think that's enough on that. I'll I'll remember your question at four o'clock this morning. If you <laughs> well, it's a fair question. Thank you very much.